Tick tock, time to rock. How's everyone doing this lovely evening, morning, afternoon, whatever it may be? For all the people who are watching all around the world, I am your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me is the Assyrian Encyclopedia. Sam, why do they call you the Assyrian Encyclopedia? Besides being shaped like a huge bookshelf, it's because by the grace of the Lord Jesus, by the grace of God, I'm able to recall passages related to any question that's raised, and all glory to the Holy Spirit. I pray he perfects it in me to use it mightily for the glory of Jesus until he takes me home. So that's why. Mm -hmm. And uh, why do they call you Triple B? Because I'm big, bald, and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Emphasis on big. And why, yeah, do, yeah, yeah. why, do, uh, why oh, sorry, do I? Sorry, sorry. Why do I call you Shameless Shamoon? Because the story goes, and I don't know. I don't even want to mention him because he's trying to make the circuit again, the rounds again. He just embarrassed himself with Michael Brown. The story goes that Nadir Ahmed used to take a shot at me. He used to call me Shameless Shamoon because he saw me wearing the same shirt on one occasion, and then months later he saw that shirt worn out. And he pretty much called me shameless for not cleaning my shirts, for being a bum. That certainly is shameless. So, uh, shameless. That's why I can call you. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the song, the song that I've been singing to Sam for years, it's uh, shameless. How can you have no shame? Shameless. You're trying to make a name. Oh, shameless. And it's, it's just all about uh, Sam Shamoon being uh, shameless. Shameless Shamoon. All right, well, uh, let's just say hi to everyone. Just call out anyone uh, you know, Sam. We'll greet everyone here at the beginning, and then we will get into our topic. Who do we got? We got the old woman. We've got Gerard Perry. We got Christ is Lord, Protestant believer. Yeah. Ronald Smith. Got Bill Thompson. We got uh, Joshua Nagalingham. In the super chat, we have uh, Romeo and Julia, <laughs> Riaz Qureshi. Yeah, Riaz is almost uh, is uh, I think he goes to all of our uh, all of our live streams. Yeah, no, Riaz is is very <clears throat> devoted in exposing Islam and glorifying Jesus Christ. You also see him on Samir Abdullah's channel. Mm -hmm. he, he frequents it there, an apostate mm -hmm. prophet. And also, you got a precious sister here named Marcy Lynn. Marcy Lynn, she's a nurse, and she's battling cancer, hmm. and she's still <clears throat> fully functional in her job. She didn't pull back and just go home and sit home from the virus. She's still actively working in the hospital as a nurse, even though she has cancer, because she's sold out for Jesus and love, love with Jesus, and she wants to be a light of Christ to those who are sick. So God bless her and her service. May the Lord Jesus preserve her for his glory. Just wanted to mention her, you know? Yep. We got Walter, got the honest truth, King Kong, Jeremiah fifteen sixteen, theistic leaning, yeah, agnostic. Yeah, he's, theistic. He's, he also comes. Yeah. Let's see. He said, "Hey, David and Sam, back last year, you did a live stream on Allah's two sons, and yes. Sam talked about the Quran verses turning up like flocks of birds, and you said you might have Mo meet the uh, Muhammad meet the birds in uh in Muhammad's <laughs> boom boom room. Hey, that would actually be good. I don't I don't remember saying that I was going to have the birds meet Muhammad. I, I don't remember most of the brilliant stuff I come up with. That's why I need like I need four I need four note takers around me at all time cuz I blurt out all these awesome ideas all throughout the day and then like a year later people would be like, "Oh, you remember you had that idea?" And I'll be like, "I don't I have no recollection of that at all, but it sounds like something I would say." So uh but but look, now look how brilliant this is, right? <clears throat> so for anyone who doesn't know what this is about, um you have the, the, the according to Muhammad, the Quran is multipersonal, right? The Quran appears as a single man, a pale man, and will speak on your behalf on, on Judgment Day and so on. But keep in mind, the Quran is eternal and then, of course, comes in the form of a man. And yet, Muhammad also said that individual chapters of the Quran show up as flocks of birds that speak and testify on your behalf. So notice, if, if these things, they, they're keeping notes on you, they, they know what you do, and they actually show up and testify on your behalf, that means they're, they're personal agents. What that means is, in the Quran, you have 114 personal agents, and yet they form one Quran, but that's exactly the sort of thing that Muslims say makes no sense and is proof that your, 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 your belief is false, and yet that's true of their Quran, but that's what their prophet said about their Quran, so their prophet is a false prophet, even according to what, what he said. 
But apart from that, uh, you've got this issue of these birds. So I guess what I said is I would have Muhammad uh, meet these birds, these flocks of birds in Muhammad's boom boom room. But if I were if I was actually planning that, then I would do it. I don't know if you remember uh, Sam the the horror film uh, Stephen King's The Birds. Oh, yeah, those yeah. birds start attacking, yeah. but it would kind of yeah. it would kind of end up like that with birds. I'm guessing yeah. I would have it with birds attacking Muhammad, and they're uh, eating eyeballs out and uh, telling him, uh, "I don't know, I don't know what we're gonna do." It yeah, sounds I like so, it sounds from... it sounds like something I would plan when someone has annoyed me, but I wouldn't actually do. But if someone annoyed me and did and crossed the line, then I would do it, and then they'd be mad at me for 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 doing that when it was them that crossed the line. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you know, uh, you know, you got me confused for a minute when you said. Uh, old woman is here, Gerald Perry. I thought you were calling Gerald Perry. No, 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 no. No, I, I, I finally figured it out. Is it, by the way, just curious, it, I think today the Orthodox Christians are celebrating yeah. Easter, right? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Wait, is that, so, yeah. is that today or tomorrow? I mean, uh, well, it, you today, know, today, Friday for them was today is tomorrow. Yeah, today yeah. is tomorrow for them. Because yeah. I'm seeing them, they're saying, Christianesti, Christ is risen, and I don't want to forget our Orthodox <clears throat> brothers and sisters our brothers and sisters born of the Spirit, purchased by the blood of Jesus from the Orthodox churches, we wish you a happy Resurrection Weekend. Happy Easter, but I prefer to say Resurrection Weekend. He is risen, risen indeed, and may He forgive us. May the Lord Jesus wash us, and may He fill us with the Spirit to glorify Him in this session and live for Him. Please, Lord Jesus, show up for your glory in Jesus' name. So, Christi Anesti, He is risen, risen indeed. And, uh, Sam, you already have uh, Pedro Jr. here saying Sam Shamoon is a prophet according to Muslims because he was prophesied by Michael Jackson evidence when he said Shamoon that's right multiple man. times Shamoon Shamoon I, I think right. we, we haven't we haven't released it yet but we have an episode of Muhammad's boom boom room where Muhammad meets Michael Jackson and uh, I think he <laughs> said I think we have Michael Jackson go Shamoon and and Muhammad goes did you say Shamoon Sam Shamoon <laughs> <laughs> yeah setting it up right but yeah, remember yeah. the girl is mine because the gong gong girl is mine all right go ahead yeah all right, all right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, uh, we see everyone in the chat. We already have 700 and about 750 right now. Right now, we are going through a topic. Uh, this past Tuesday, I issued a challenge to Muslims. Show me one unequivocal verse, one unequivocal verse in the Quran where Allah declares that the gospel has been corrupted. So earlier this week, a ton of Muslims sent me a video. A ton of Muslims sent me a video from Mufassal Islam saying, well, he refuted me, and uh, I, now I need to accept Islam like I, like I said I would. We watched the video. We went through the entire video. The only thing he said was that I was right, <laughs> that there is no verse that directly says in the Quran that the gospel has been corrupted. He agreed with me. So notice the, the mindset of the viewers here, those who are Muslims. They can watch a video, a video that agrees with me, and say that it refutes me when it agreed with me, right? Well, guess what? Right now, uh, Sam, you remember this last night, right? What were the Muslims in the chat saying? They were saying, aha, but what about Adnan Rashid's? Notice. And then your comment section, too. Please, Adnan Rashid refuted you. He refuted you. In your comment section, boy. And not only that, not only that, but... It seems like you can never answer, you can never focus on one question because they, they try to change it, right? So if they if they say, aha, Mufasal Islam res refuted you. And I say, okay, let's go through his entire video as soon as we start going through it. Oh, but you're ignoring, you're ignoring Adnan Rashid. And now we're going to go through Adnan Rashid and they're going to come up with something else. Oh, but you ignored this guy. But the same thing happened. They're telling me Adnan Rashid refuted you and destroyed you when guess what? Adnan Rashid agreed with what I said too. Adnan Rashid agreed there is no unequivocal verse in the Quran that says that the gospel has been corrupted. So I, I, it's just amazing, Sam. I can make my point. Muslim, uh, Muslim speakers and apologists can agree with my point, and then yeah. the, their Muslim viewers somehow don't understand what I said and don't understand what their what their speakers and apologists say. And then, but they say it refuted me just because it was their speaker saying it, even if it even if the speaker agreed with me. This, this is this is an amazing religion, man. Yeah, it, it's like I said, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to sound, sound like a broken record. If you want proof that there's a spirit realm in which you have Satan and evil spirits working so hard to blind people from the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, look to Muslims and it will erase any doubt you have because there has to be something spiritual that keeps them so blind and hardens them against 
<clears throat> evidence that even a blind man can see clearly the implications of, of our claim. But hey, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, do your work in their hearts and strengthen the church for the glory of Jesus. Take over. So that's what it is. <clears throat> All right. And uh, guys, I see uh, I see a bunch of people uh, starting off with Super Chats. We'll want to get to those. But uh, I did want to I did want to suggest an alternative to sending me Super Chats this evening, um, namely that uh, now I can't do this very frequently because I, I'm getting a lot of requests. And, and basically, guys, the requests are people who are uh, out of work due to coronavirus and they're having some financial difficulties. So again, I, I can't I can't do this a lot just because I know some people who are really really hurting. And so, if I if I get the opportunity to uh, invite people to ask support for uh, for for them, I know some people who are who are already in really bad situation because of medical problems and stuff before the coronavirus, and now it's like being amplified and so on. Wow. So, um, but here th I wanted to do this one. Uh, I wanted to 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 share this one just because uh, this is a young guy, and it's him and his grandma, and he w he documented everything very well, and he's been uh, he's been a follower of my channel for. Uh, a long time. Let me see if I have the technology to get this up on the screen. Um, where is it? Where is it? All right. All right. Here you have uh, to GoFundMe. So anyway, <clears throat> this is from uh, Nicholas. Again, he's been following my stuff for a long time. Um, he's only asking for uh, 300 uh, 300 uh, pounds or euros or whatever, uh, whatever that is. Uh, so he's asking for 300, but it's basically he t has to take... Uh, seizure and thyroid medi medication and down below if you if you go to the if you go to the read more section you can see he's got he's got up on the screen the prescription he's got everything documented up on there the the, the prescriptions yeah. and, and everything and he's basically saying that they're okay they they have money to survive they have money to eat but uh after he lost his job he lost his insurance and he said it's only it's only 300 for uh, basically a three month supply for both him and his grandmother. So this is a small amount. This is a small amount that yeah. I think people could cover pretty quickly. So guys, why don't we, uh, instead of uh, instead of sending me money tonight, why don't you go ahead and uh, click on yeah, there yeah, and yeah. send them and we'll, we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this yeah, and see amen. if we can actually get this guy's uh, costs covered. And uh, in which case that would be, a, that'd yeah. be a pretty cool thing. Oh, wait, I, oh, darn it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I realized yeah. I didn't include the link. <laughs> Yeah. I did not. Yeah, include... I need the link too. I yeah, I'll include the link that people. Share it, yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Now, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I don't understand why aren't the governments helping these people in their need, especially that they put them on shutdown. I can't figure it out. It doesn't make sense. Well, the, I think the governments are, are kind of doing what they can, but uh, it's going to be a lot of people having problems, and that's why. That's basically why we kind of, you know, people need to stick together during these times and we need to help each yeah. other out when we can. And this is this is just one of those situations where we have an opportunity to notice there are lots of people and helping this one person doesn't help everyone, but it helps this person and his grandma. You remember that story, Sam? There's a story years ago about a guy who was walking along a beach um, and uh, he saw a kid throwing a he was taking starfish that beached starfish starfish that were up on the sand and throwing them back in the water and the guy mm -hmm. said with, with all the thousands of beached starfish in the world um what wh why do you think you can actually <laughs> you can actually help these starfish and he goes i can help this one and he threw he throws it a smart kid response. throws it in the water um all right i am if you guys update your browser now yeah I'll share it on my Facebook page too. So hopefully, yeah. well, get I mean, I mean, don't worry. Tonight. I, I think, I think we can, we can. I mean, we might, we might have like it tonight. Covered. He should have it. Yeah, yeah we might. No, we, we, we should. Yeah, he should have it. Yeah. So wait, if if uh, if we got it covered, if we got it covered here, then uh, then we're good, and and then that that problem solved. Amen. Um. All right. So our topic. Yeah, I just wanted to share that while we have the chance. Um. Our topic tonight. Our topic tonight okay. is, um. Fact, Surprise, David. <laughs> now, so once again, we have, uh, this time we have our good friend Adnan Rashid. This time we have our good friend Adnan Rashid. And, and we've, uh, you know, we've had interactions with uh, Adnan for many years. Um, the amazing thing is Adnan's going to agree with me as well. I think I'm going to have to post a video tomorrow just saying, guys, these links you're sending me where these guys are telling me that, that, I'm wrong about something. They're not telling me I'm wrong, I'm wrong about the Quran not having one single unequivocal verse that says that the gospel has been corrupted. I'm not wrong about that. 
uh, they'll 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 make a long. Uh, now the strategy seems to make longer and longer videos so that you think I've been refuted if you're not watching yeah. it. And so, yeah. well, you know, Nod's video is 18, 19 minutes long. He must have refuted him somewhere in there. Therefore, I don't even need to watch it. Um, brilliant, 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 uh, brilliant. Uh, issue. All right. Well, Sam, for, we have a thousand people now live. Why don't you give people an idea of what the <clears throat> issue is uh, as yes. far as the Quran <clears throat> affirming the Bible, why this is important and why we're bringing this up? Yes, yes. May the Lord Jesus again have mercy on us for our shortcomings and failures and sanctify us and purify us in his blood and fill us with the spirit to glorify the name of Jesus because he's worthy. Lord have mercy. You guys remember the video that David Wood posted. <clears throat> Muslims insist that we must find an unequivocal, and that's actually parroting Ahmadidat. Mm -hmm. Ahmadidat. If you go back and watch his videos on YouTube, there's not a single unequivocal statement where Jesus says, I am God, or worship me. And then he makes this silly challenge. If you show me an unequivocal statement where he says, I am God, worship me, I'm ready to get baptized this Sunday. All right, now, so what did David Wood do? do? He goes, okay, equal weights and measures, what we call equal weights and measures. Let's use arguments consistently. If you can show an unequivocal statement in the Quran that says the gospel or the Bible is corrupt, then he's ready to become Muslim. That's how certain David Wood is that they cannot find such a statement because he would never become a Muslim. He's too much in love with Jesus and he belongs to Jesus Christ. So that's the challenge, folks. The challenge isn't to show that the Quran contradicts the Bible. That's exactly our point, that the Quran claims that the scriptures of the Jews and Christians that were in existence at the time of Muhammad. And Muslims, I want you to hear this. At the time of Muhammad, the Quran repeatedly, and if God wills, we'll go into those verses, repeatedly says to the Jews and Christians at Muhammad's time, your scriptures are the uncorrupt, preserved words of God, God's revelations that you need to live up to and judge by. But the problem is, those scriptures are the same scriptures we possess today, because that's a fact of history, that's a fact of just textual criticism and archaeology. And the scriptures they had, which is equivalent to what we have, expose Muhammad as a false prophet because he contradicts those scriptures. So when you have Ahmadi, uh, Ahmadi Dad, Adnan Rashid or Mufassil pointing to places in the Quran that disagree with the Bible, that's exactly our point. Mm -hmm. Your prophet said the Bible's not corrupt, it's preserved, live up to it, use the Bible as a standard to judge my revelations. And yet he goes and contradicts the Bible, proving he's a false prophet. Mm -hmm. So uh, notice we all agree, Muslims, so Mufassal Islam, uh, Adnan Rashid, we all agree that the Bible contradicts the Quran. We all agree that the Gospels contradict the Quran. The question is, does the Quran affirm the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Gospel that we have? If so, game over. <laughs> game over. Your religion's false, Muslims. Your religion is false, right? If you affirm scriptures that contradict your own scriptures, then your religion has just self-destructed. So that's what we are claiming has happened. The Muslims agree with part of what we say. They agree that, um, that our Bible contradicts their Quran. And I point out all these verses where the Quran affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of our scriptures. And so I ask, show me one verse where Allah criticizes the gospel, where he says that it's been corrupted. Just show me one. And they can't do that, and they admit that they can't. So they've basically, they're, they're granting the entire Islamic dilemma while just, while just avoiding the conclusion. Because yeah. the conclusion is that, therefore, Islam is false. And they do not want to acknowledge that Islam is false. All right. Well, By the way, David, oh my goodness. praise report. What? Let me just give you a praise report because you're amazing and your subscribers are amazing. They love Jesus. Tatiana just announced, <clears throat> we met the goal. The brother got us 300 euros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking that it, it might be a, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Hang on, this might be, uh, this might, uh, I might be slightly, uh, there might be, sometimes these take several minutes to, uh, to update. But yeah, let me just go back to this and... Here you have it. Notice already got already got 290 of 300. So that was pretty uh that was pretty instant. So uh 
Uh, God bless good. you guys. Yeah. That just tells you you love Jesus and are willing to sacrifice for Jesus. May he bless you. That's what we want. Soldiers, sold out for Jesus, doers of his word. Lord, make me one of those doers as well. All right, so, so that's cool. So Nicholas and his grandmother, again, it was, it was, you know, it was cool because they weren't, they weren't being greedy. It was just, you know, hey, we're, we're alive, but we, we just can't afford our medication right now for the next few months. And then we've covered it for the next few months. And then hopefully a few months from now, uh, things, are, things are looking better in the world. Um, all right. Well, uh, should we get into uh, uh, good old Adnan? Go ahead, bro. <laughs> but be careful. Adnan is kind of dangerous. You know, he schooled you in the past. Get ready to take Shahada, brother. It's going to break my heart. Baby. On the satanic verses. What, a, what an awesome debate that Dang, was. bro. All right. Shoot, bro. He's a computer. All right. So here we go. First clip of Adnan Rashid. Oh, Sam, if you want to see these, uh, most of these, I think, are around a minute long or a little bit longer. So you should actually be able to uh, be able to catch uh, catch some of these okay. uh, if you turn your audio up. All right. Here we have Adnan Rashid completely refuting me and yet, as we'll see, agreeing with me completely as usual. That I hereby vow that I will record myself bowing down and reciting the Shahada. In this video, we will show you that David Wood wouldn't accept Islam even though it is true. What will follow is my response to a recent video made by David Wood and you will see what he's talking about. As you can tell from the title of this video, I'm going to ask a question. Not a confusing question, a simple question. And no Muslim on the planet, not the least, not the greatest, will be able to answer it. In fact, I'm so confident that no Muslim will be able to answer my easy, straightforward question that I hereby vow that I will record myself bowing down and reciting the Shahada if a single Muslim can answer it. Once our Muslim friends realize why they can't answer my simple question, they're on their way out of Islam. If you've had a discussion with a Muslim, you've probably heard the Muslim ask, where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me, in those words? Muslims were trained by Zakir Naik and Ahmed Didat to ask this question. All right. Well, that was just a little uh, a little intro. That was mainly me talking, but me once again uh, introducing the scene. Actually, Sam, I think we could probably pretty quickly go through these first few videos because they're just okay. basically intro videos. Uh, anything you want to add based on that? Well, I mean, so far, I haven't heard anything that's going to you know, shake my foundation. So what <laughs> what is he going to say to rock rock you and make you take Shahada? Let's it's, see. Let's, it's, it's pretty funny, but uh, um, yeah. Let's he's, see. he's going to end up destroying his own religion <laughs> without <laughs> right. realizing it. Guys, right. and, uh, yeah, so this is this is a live stream. We know that, that not everyone likes the live streams because we tend to go, We you know, they, they tend to be a couple hours long. I'm like that. I prefer short videos, condensed, yeah. get your argument as condensed as possible. Live streams are pretty long, but I will probably, separate from this, make a shorter video going through what some of these guys are saying, just to show that the Muslim apologists are actually agreeing with me and Muslims think they're refuting me when they're agreeing with me. All right, next video. All right. Now, putting aside Zakir Naik and Sheikh Ahmadi Dat, the question is valid. It is a core doctrine of the Christians. The Christians have this core doctrine that Jesus is God. Isn't, isn't it a fair question to ask, where is that statement in the Bible? If it is a core doctrine of Christians, it's like asking the Muslims, where is God one in the Quran? Where is he declared as one in the Quran? Isn't that a fair question? When you have a core doctrine, then it must be clearly stated no. More recently, Zakir Naik and co. have been training Muslims to say, show me one unequivocal statement where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I am God or worship me. By the way, it wasn't Zakir Naik who trained Muslims to ask that question. It was the Quran. In chapter 5 of the Quran, verse 116, God teaches us to ask this question. In fact, we are told that there will be a dialogue on the Day of Judgment when God will ask this question from Jesus himself. Did you tell people to worship you beside me? Did you tell people to worship you and your mother beside me? Because Catholics are worshipping Mary, they're praying to Mary, which amounts to worship, of course. And the uh, Christians at large are praying to Jesus Christ, they're worshipping Jesus Christ. So this question was actually taught to us by God Almighty himself in the Quran. Hmm. Ball! <laughs> he says this question was taught to them uh, by the Quran, yeah. not what by Ahmed Didat and Zakir Naik. Guys, yeah. it's Zakir Naik who's saying, 
Show me one verse, one unequivocal statement of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, where he says, I am God who worship me. That comes from Zachar Naik. That is a direct quotient. My, my, yes. my quote that I used in my video is a direct quote from Zachar Naik. So yes, yes, uh, yes, yes, the Quran encourages Muslims to question the deity of Christ and so on. Yes, but that, no, I'm sorry, that question came from Zachar Naik. Stop, stop, stop acting like your God came up with that question. Uh, besides yeah. that, Sam, are there, oh my goodness. Yeah. Hang on. No, here's the thing. Well, uh, you okay? Hang on. Yeah, just giving a. Uh, <laughs> just wanted what to happened? show it. Just wanted to show everyone which what happened in the past ten minutes. Um. Oh yes, praise report. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Nicholas only needed three hundred to cover his uh his uh his medication. Uh, he did he did document everything. He showed all the prescriptions yes. and what the medication was for, and and uh, that that he has a thyroid disorder and stuff like that. And uh, so Nicholas. Uh, he said 300 for a three month supply. He's got 1100, so I think he's good for Glory the year. Thank you, Father, the the Son, and Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for raising up your children, children of the living God, born of your spirit, soldiers who love you, Lord Jesus, willing to sacrifice, help those in need. Lord Jesus, bless you guys. God bless you. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All uh, right. So, and that, by the way, David, real quickly, unless up, what's someone up? says, Oh, you're a modalist heretic, you said we're the children of Christ. In one sense, he, we are his children, that he's the second Adam the head of a new creation of redeemed human beings, glorified in union with him and transformed by the spirit to conform to his image. So don't accuse me of modalism, okay? Just one, because I'm, I, 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 when I came out of my mouth, I go, uh oh, here we go. The modalists are gonna start attacking me now. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, yeah, but you know, you're a dirty little modalist. You ain't lying. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. All right, so, uh, now, now to, to, to be fair, uh, what what Anand said there? Hey, we, you know we're just asking for a for a, a verse. You guys are saying Jesus is God. Um, we're looking for an unequivocal verse. Um, as far as that goes, yeah, I think Anand missed the entire point of my video. Yep. The point was we do have those, but by when you guys say unequivocal, you mean something that's not even uh, not even it can't be reinterpreted by a human being. And yes. we've seen that no matter what. No matter what the Bible is saying, you will reinterpret it, right? If you have a verse like John 1.1, 1, 1, which clearly says the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then the Word became flesh, the Word, which was God, became flesh, entered into creation, they'll reinterpret all of that. They'll reinterpret 100%. all of that. When Jesus claims to be the final judge, when Jesus, and I, I, I said this part in the video, when Jesus claims to be the first and the last, in other words, when he takes the names, which even according to the Quran are the names of God, and he calls himself by the names of God, um, or when he claims to do the things that only God does, like being the one who raises the dead at the resurrection. And you know, that you know, of course, the response I got from Muslims in the chat was, uh, oh, but you know, we believe that Jesus raised the dead. No, you're talking the resurrection. <sighs> the resurrection when everyone is called out of their grave, right? That's what Jesus yeah. says that he does. That's what the Quran says Allah does. Now, if Allah is the one who does it, and Jesus says he's the one who does it, how do you not interpret that as a claim of him to be God? Um, when when you take something like when you take something like the word God as it was used uh, among the ancient Jews, the word the word Elohim could be applied not just to God, but to other things. It could be applied to false gods, angels, judges who represent God in certain situations. And so that's a pretty generic term. When you claim to be the first and the last, that is a title of God that applies only to Yahweh in the Old Testament and that applies only to Allah in the Quran. So when Jesus calls himself that, he's calling himself by specific names, right? And yet they'll say, they'll just reinterpret that. So my criticism in the video is really what you guys mean when you challenge when you challenge us for these passages, you're challenging us to do to say something that you can't, you know, that can't be possibly reinterpreted when history shows you guys will reinterpret everything. But when, yep. when I'm doing it, I'm doing it in, a, just, just give me a verse, right? Just give me a verse. I'm phrasing it the way you guys phrasing it, but give me one verse that, that, it clearly means that the, the gospel has been corrupted. And so far, they haven't been able to give one. All right, what yeah. are you thinking so far, Sam? Yeah, it's interesting. He blames Allah for asking bad questions. So you can thank Adnan and send him your comment saying, hey, thank you for, for showing us that it's Allah who's taught you to ask erroneous questions, questions that do not accurately reflect what Christians or other groups believe. Because notice what he appealed to, guys. Pay attention to the passage he cited to try to show that where Zachariah got this challenge was from Allah. <clears throat> Ahmad Didad got it from Allah. In chapter 5, verse 116 of the Quran, there this 
fictional dialogue takes place between Isa, supposedly Jesus, and Allah, and it's supposed to be at the last day, where it says, Oh, Isa, did you tell mankind, pay attention, to take you and your mothers as two gods be in the place of or besides Allah? Well, number one, and I want Adnan Rashid not to tap dance around this. If he's going to listen to this, and I'm sure he's going to listen to it, at least the Muslims are listening to it, I want you to document, document any historic Orthodox Christian group. When I mean Orthodox Christian group, I'm not saying the Orthodox Church per se. I'm talking about true Christians that represented historic Christianity at the time of Muhammad, even before the time of Muhammad, that believe that Jesus is a God besides God. Don't quote me the Arians. The Arians are not true Bible-believing Christians, and we can debate that issue. Don't misquote the Church Fathers, because the Church Fathers, when they spoke about Jesus, for example, Justin Martyr, being a second God, that was simply his way of denoting the fact that Jesus is a distinct person from the Father. So when they would speak of, let's say, two gods, what they meant clearly there is that they're two persons. So don't expect them to use the precise language that later Christians developed to be more accurate in, in <clears throat> expressing what the Bible teaches. So I want to know which historic Christian group believed that Jesus is a God besides God, or that Mary is a goddess in union with Jesus and Allah. So I want Adnan, I want to thank Adnan for admitting that it's his God that taught him to ask the wrong questions because this does not reflect the views of Christianity historically. So thank you, Adnan, for blaming your God, for misinforming you and teaching you to ask the wrong questions. Way yeah. to go, buddy. And, and no, notice, Sam. They're they're actually on the they're actually on the right track of locating or helping us locate a problem in their methodology, right? So where th this whole this whole session is basically pointing out a problem with their methodology. Adnan's going to argue against that methodology. We're going to show why Adnan's got the problem here, but it's they'll they'll say ah one unequivocal verse, right? And then if we say one unequivocal verse, then they're going to argue that it's it's uh, it, it, we're being unreasonable in in our demand. 100%. That's what that's what Adnan's going to argue. But notice even here, right? When Adnan when Adnan says, "Show me the doctrine of the Trinity in your Scripture," right? Or show me the doctrine of the Trinity before you know the the fourth century councils. He wants extremely precise formulation of what we're talking about, right? It has to be yeah. extremely precise, right? They have to say exactly the same thing that was said by later church councils, and they have to say it right there at the beginning, or or the or the doctrine just didn't exist or something, right? Yes. That's what they're pointing out. And yet, if we were to just flip the exact methodology right back on them, show us where your God condemns the doctrine of the Trinity that 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 we believe in. Their only response, because I brought this up to them, is, well, he said three, and therefore if he said three, then then he he uh, he rejected all all versions of the Trinity. Oh. Well, we don't yeah. know what he means by three. The only time he says what we mean by three, he gets it wrong. Exactly. So so and, and he he represents them as three separate gods who just work as one. So the only time he tries to explain what the doctrine of the Trinity is, he gets it wrong. So if you want extremely precise formulations of these doctrines and so on, why does your why do you demand that of us, right? Like extremely pre guys, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is that the Father's God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and there's only one God, right? That, that's, yes. that, that, that's it in a nutshell. Later, later Christian theologians had to wrestle with that and say, how do we take all of Scripture into account and formulate it in precise little confessions and creeds? and make sense of it and so they you know they they, they would come up with with uh, ways of you know well we'll talk about substance and we'll talk about person things like that so yes. they came up with a way of encapsulating the testimony of scripture but then whenever they come up with some little you know some confession or something like that then the muslims say ah show us that confession there well the confession is a condensed version of what you find in scripture that's the, that's the role of the confession right yeah. and they say aha show us all of this in 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 scripture in one little sentence or one little verse and not looking and seeing why these guys affirmed that because that is what scripture affirms, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. the problem. But then when they turn to their own revelations and their God clearly has no clue what Christians mean by the doctrine of the Trinity, then suddenly he's dismissing our doctrine of the Trinity without even saying it, what it is he's dismissing. Exactly. And the, only thing, the only thing he does say about the Trinity, he gets wrong. 
Yeah. So 100%. why does why does the burden why is the, why does the standard of proof and the burden drop to the floor whenever Allah is speaking? And that <laughs> that's what we're trying to fix, right? That's what we're trying to fix. We're saying if Allah is in, in this con what we're talking about now in this in this uh, in, in these videos we've been doing, if Allah is somehow telling us that the gospel has been corrupted, couldn't He say it at least once? Couldn't He yeah. say that that's what He's saying just once? And David, don't forget, you want to hammer this so that the Christians can use this argument effectively against the Muslims. By the 7th century, the doctrine of the Trinity had been precisely formulated uh -huh. with the precise terminology. 7th century, we're talking about 600s, right? Muhammad's born 570 AD, supposedly he becomes a prophet at 610 AD. So you can't tell me, well, earlier centuries, the Christians used less than precise terminology to describe to the best of their ability, what the Bible said about the Father being God, the Son being God, the Spirit being God, but not three gods, one God, but using language that may give the impression that they thought there was more than one God. Put that aside. Seventh century, Muhammad is dealing with the Christians, and he just said about core doctrines of, the, of, of Islam. Core doctrines need to be unequivocal. Remember he said that? He said they need mm -hmm. to be unequivocal. Oh, yeah. Well, the heart of Christianity in the seventh century, the, the heart of their faith is who God is. And the core doctrine of Christianity across the board, Nestorians, Miophysites, you name them, Diophysites, whoever they were, was that God is triune. And they already came up with the precise terminology at the time of Muhammad. They already knew how to <clears throat> succinctly and precisely define what they believe about the Trinity. So at the very least, we'd expect Allah, who's supposedly the greatest communicator because he's Allah, uh -huh. to then... <clears throat> repeat what they believe precisely and condemn it and yet he fails miserably yep um yeah he certainly does and we haven't even really gotten into how much he's going to fail uh with uh, <laughs> with that response i uh, wanted to point out a quick comment right here abdullah h um says anon quotes the crucifixion verse which yeah. says made appear to them but that only proves the gospel writers were truthful in the report <laughs> right so abdullah is saying uh, this is this is a uh, for the future here, uh, Adnan is eventually going to try and show that the gospel has been corrupted, and it's just by quoting a Quran verse that contradicts what we believe, right? And so it contradicts what the Bible says. So Abdullah is pointing out that, but according to the Quran and the Muslim view, Allah made it appear to people that Jesus was crucified. And so the gospel writers, in affirming that Jesus was crucified, we're speaking the truth. That's what they saw, right? So even where he's going, even where he's going to show that the that the gospel is wrong, the gospel writers are simply reporting exactly what they saw. And so that's uh, interesting stuff. Thank you, uh, thank you, Abdullah H. Um, all right, let's go on to another clip from Adnan. I think we can get through a couple a couple more of these. Um, let's see. Show me one unequivocal statement where Jesus Christ peace be upon him, says, I am God, or worship me. Notice, Zakir Naik and co. demand that the statement be unequivocal, meaning unambiguous, not open to interpretation. Because it is your core doctrine. It has to be unequivocal. If it is a core doctrine, it must be clearly stated. At least God can do that much. If Jesus meant to be God, or if he wanted to be God, or if he was God, he surely should have said one statement. He should have made one statement that I am God. <laughs> Jesus has the time to curse the Pharisees. He had the time to curse the tree. He had the time to have a dialogue with the Samaritan woman in uh, the Gospel of John chapter 4, verse 21 onwards. He had all that time, but didn't have the time to tell the Christians of the world, I am God. All right, so uh, there he's uh, he's he's getting to his point, and we'll probably want to watch. Uh, I I think he'll I think he'll be able to. I think we'll have his full perspective here in a moment. His position is going to be that the deity of Christ is a core Christian doctrine, and therefore we need unequivocal statements. Whereas the the position of the Christian and Jewish scriptures is not a core Islamic doctrine, and therefore. And therefore, we don't need unequivocal statements. Now, the problem we're going to see there is apparent. Hey, Sam, have you ever heard of something called the six articles of faith? Yes, I've heard that. Um, oh, that's not the Bible. That's Islam. Have you heard of uh, Have you heard of the the five pillars of Islam? 
Yes, I have. Interestingly, okay. yeah, and how to and the prayers and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, I've heard the, that. the Muslims they tell us they tell us that their religion is simple. Well, uh, how simple? Well, it's so simple because we have everything condensed down to these five pillars. These are the core practices of Islam. So it's you know recite the Shahada and you say your prayers and you uh, you give your your alms and you fast during Ramadan and you take the pilgrimage. Five quick, five easy practices right there. See, yes. our practices are so simple. And then we get to we get to the six articles of faith, which are these the these are the core beliefs that every Muslim is required to believe. And we look at the six articles of faith. These core <laughs> these core Muslim beliefs, and it's uh, belief in the oneness of Allah and belief in the angels, belief in the books, the books. Yes. And go to go to go yes, to any Muslim 100%. list of these. It's it's the Torah, the Psalms, the Gospel, and the Quran. The books, the prophets, the day of judgment, and uh, what you could call fate or something like that, that, that Allah has decided what your destiny is. And so Adnan Rashid is going to say, this is not core doctrine. This is not core doctrine. It's on their six articles of faith that they have to believe in the books. And so we're asking, give us a statement which is telling you what to believe, because the only thing your God says about these books is that they're all the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. You're the ones telling us not to believe in that book. Your God says, hey, that gospel that you Christians have, believe in that. It's a requirement of the Islamic faith. And you same Muslims who affirm your, your, that you have the true religion and that these are the articles of faith, you tell us, don't believe what Allah says there. And yeah, how is that yeah. not a core, that, how is that not a core doctrine, Sam? Yeah, exactly. And one thing we want to highlight to them, David, when he said that because the deity of Christ is a core doctrine of the Christian faith, so Jesus should have just came out and said it unequivocally, especially had all the time in the world in John 4 with the Samaritan woman. Here's the problem. And this is what I want the Christians to get more so. I want the Muslims to get it, but this is more for the Christians so that they can understand why our Lord Jesus didn't simply come out and say, I am God. And I need the Christians to pay attention to this, because this is something you need to know. Since our Lord Jesus is not the Father, and he's not the Holy Spirit. And guys, <clears throat> this is the reason why you couldn't ask for more explicit statements than what you find in the Gospels from the lips of Jesus in identifying him as God in the flesh without confusing him with the Father. In the first century, going up to a first century Jew, and you say to a first century Jew, I am God, to that first century Jew, God, the word God, typically was used in reference to the one in heaven whom they called Father. So if Jesus came out and simply said, I am God, without qualification, that would have been miscommunication because they would have assumed that he's claiming to be the one in heaven whom they called the Father. So how could our Lord Jesus explicitly identify himself as God in the flesh without confusing his audience into thinking that he's the Father? The exact way you find him articulating his deity in the gospel. So in other words, if Jesus did what Adnan said Jesus should have done, then he would have confused people, not illuminated people, because they would have been confused into thinking he's saying he's the Father. So how does our Lord go about affirming, I'm not the Father? So the one in heaven you call the Father, he's God, I'm not him. But I am God in the flesh, even though I'm not the same person as the Father. By claiming to be the unique Son of God, who can do what only God can do, even though he's not the Father. And voila, David, what do we find throughout the Gospels? The Jews perfectly understanding that Jesus is saying, I'm not the Father, but still you're claiming to be God in the flesh. So yes, Jesus did unequivocally claim to be God in a manner that would make sense to his audience and not confuse them. To simply say, I'm God, that would have been miscommunication, and Jesus is the perfect communicator, the perfect speaker, because he's God in the flesh. So he wants to make sure that they realize, I'm not the Father, but I am one with the Father, the unique divine Son, who is God in the flesh, distinct from the Father. And that's exactly what we find in the gospel. So you can't ask for anything more explicit and unequivocal if Jesus is not the Father, but wants to make sure that they realize he is God in the flesh. Now, where am I wrong, David? Yeah, um, notice, uh, Muslims approach all of this, and you've pointed this out many times in the past. Muslims approach everything like Unitarians, right? Like Jesus should have walked out and, and declared himself the, the Unitarian God. If, if that's what he, we're, our position is that we're, we're Trinitarians and Trinitarians who believe that the 
second person of the Trinity, the Son, entered creation as Jesus of Nazareth. So Trinitarians who also believe in the incarnation of Jesus, if, as Sam pointed out, if Jesus were to walk out and say what Muslims say that he should have said, that would have been massively misinterpreted by everyone. Yes. They would not have understood that, right? 100%. If, in fact, it, Dave, just to confirm, what do Muslims tell us when we say Jesus God? Who is he praying to? Yeah, is who he did he pray to? Yeah, Did he yeah. send himself? See, they're yeah. proving what we just said, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it proof? When you say Jesus God, then who is he praying to? Uh, who sent him? Did he send himself? Was he? So they're actually proving what I just said. Uh -huh. To simply come on and say Jesus is God without qualifying that you're not saying he's the Father would lead to those wrong, erroneous questions and wrong assumptions. So their very objections are proof of what I'm saying. But go ahead, brother. You're, you're trying to finish a point. Oh, yeah, I was. And then I saw a comment by Navid Taj, David Wood, and Sam Shamoon. If you are too thin-skinned to answer my critique of your false gospel, then get out of the ministry. <laughs> I know you've read my rebuttal to your false uh, gospel many times. Actually, Navid, that's the, first time I've, that's the first time I've ever seen or heard that you posted a response. So keep, keep your response in mind. Hold on to it. We're going to go through these clips of Adnan Rashid, and then we'll be happy to, uh, to, uh, pay, to check out your devastating response to our gospel that your God affirms. If you're a Muslim, I don't know what you believe. And thank um, God, uh, brother, that they're getting it. The Christians got it. They go, oh, it makes sense. Yeah. And isn't it true that that's exactly what they accused Jesus when he said yep. he's the son of God in such a way that he's yep. not the father, but equal to the father? You, a man, make yourself out to be God. You claim yep. to be equal to God. Exactly. Thank yep. you. And so uh, it's it's basically if if Muslims if Muslims want to tell Jesus what to, what he should have said, and we know that what they say he should have said would have just led to complete misunderstanding and no one would have understood the, the true Christian doctrine, then you, you can't just you can't take it seriously. If the Christian doctrine is actually correct, that Father, Son, Holy Spirit are one, and that the Son entered creation as Jesus of Nazareth, what should we find in Scripture? We should find affirmation that the Father is God, that the Son is God, that the Holy Spirit is God, that there's only one God, and that the Son entered creation as Jesus of Nazareth, and that's exactly what we find over and over again like a beating drum. So what the Muslims are saying is, <laughs> you should have had Jesus say this thing that would have led to a completely false and absurd theology if Trinitarian <laughs> theology is, is correct. Yep. If, 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 Trinity, if the Trinity is correct and the Incarnation happened, then Jesus, Jesus should have said this thing that would have led people completely astray from that, and not what he did say, which led them to the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation. Amen. This is amazing stuff. That's perfect amazing. communicator, perfect speech, and we got it perfectly. Triune God, Jesus is not the Father, not the Spirit, God in the flesh. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yep. All right, let's go on. Let's keep going. Oh, my goodness. We've only gone through three clips already. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're, let's, try, let's try and burn through these. Okay. They demand an unequivocal statement because they know that no matter what Jesus said, they can always reinterpret it. Now David will talk about the Muslim concept of interpretation. He will go on for five minutes talking about how Muslims can easily reinterpret verses and get away from the difficult meanings. That's not the case because our interpretation of the Quran is very, very limited to the Prophet and his close companions. It is the Prophet and his close companions who took the Quran directly from the Prophet can interpret the Quran. We cannot interpret the Quran at will. We do not have the, that authority. Our theologians, our scholars, our ulama, our imams cannot do that. They do not have the authority to interpret the Quran at will. However, on the other hand, the Christian theologians, clergy, priests and bishops have been doing it for centuries. For centuries, Christians have interpreted the Bible as they went along. Every time they faced a difficult question, they would interpret, reinterpret, reinterpret the reinterpretation and reinterpret the reinterpretation of the reinterpretation. This is what the Christians have been doing for the past uh, 2,000 years almost, right? So we cannot do that with the Quran. <sighs> Thankfully, we have the Hadith tradition, we have the prophetic tradition that protects us against that approach. Because what happens, you get doctrines like the divinity of Jesus Christ you get the doctrine of the Trinity and you get other erroneous ideas imposed on the scripture by people who had no connection to the Jewish milieu of Jesus Christ. Um, 
so it, it's Christians are just interpreting, reinterpreting, 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 then reinterpreting the interpretations. Right. And that's how we get to the deity of Christ. Sam, is that the case? Or right. have Christians believed in the deity of Christ since the first century? And we know that yeah. indisputably. In fact, what's ironic, Dave, you know this very well, and I hope the Christians know this. The first, the first heresy wasn't a denial of Jesus' deity. It was a denial of his humanity because they all took for granted that Jesus was divine, that he was God. Mm -hmm. And you know what I'm talking about, yeah. the so-called Gnostics. But again, that term Gnostic is used by scholars for a variety of uh, groups that believed that you had either a divine Christ manifesting in human form, docetist, or you had a divine Christ and a human Jesus. So here's what's ironic, folks. Don't take my word for it. Get any, again, any good book on church history by any qualified church historian, and this is a fact. What they were debating wasn't whether Jesus is God. They were debating whether he was truly human, and if so, how can someone who's God be human? Because the Greeks crept in and brought in their philosophical understanding of matter being evil, and that they wanted to be <clears throat> broken away from the material body and just be pure spirit. So if Jesus or Christ is divine, how could he inhabit a body of flesh, a material body, when that's corrupt and it's beneath someone that's fully divine? So it's ironic. The early heresies had to do with whether Jesus was truly human, not truly divine, truly God. Mm -hmm. It's ironic. Yeah, and so uh, it's, it's, just, it's just absolutely amazing that Adnan is talking about these reinterpretations of reinterpretations of reinterpretations, and that's how we get to our doctrines. Guys, the core doctrines of Christianity laid out, Jesus' death for sins, his resurrection, his divine nature, that's exactly what you find in our scriptures over and over and over again, like a beating drum. That's exactly what all Christians have believed. What he's referring to, and this is why this is so deceptive, right? As I said a little bit ago, what you do have is you have the, I mean, the Bible is 66 books, right? The Bible is 66 books. It's this massive compilation of texts. And you have massive, I mean, you have you have tons of passages about the deity of the Father. Of You have passages about the deity of the Spirit. You have passages about the deity of the Son. You have all of these passages, and then you have all these passages about the Incarnation. You did have a process among the Christian theologians and so on and at the councils where they would say, okay, how do we get all of that into something short? Because not everyone can read. Not everyone is even, uh, in, in the early stages, not everyone had a copy of the Bible. Uh, not everyone could read. How are we going to condense it so that Christians can know exactly what we believe? And so they would come up with nice formulations. But guess what? Someone would come along later and say, oh, your formulation doesn't include that, and so you need to fix it, or your th your your formulation doesn't account for this. And so you do have them trying to work on how to summarize the doctrine, things like that. You do have that. And then lots of times what would happen was a heresy would arise, and they would have to make the formulation more explicit so that it's clear yes. that the formulation is rejecting that heresy, right? Yes. So that's, that's the process. But Adnan, he looks at that process and says, oh, they're just revising the revisions and interpreting the... Dude, read the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Death, deity, and resurrection all over the place. Right? And D David, I want to also highlight, because again, uh, we have to hold him to a higher standard because he's mm -hmm. been debating Christians for years, and he's mm -hmm. debated is Samuel Green, yourself, James White, others. So he's not ignorant. Yeah. When he says Muslims, he speaks as if Mus Islam is monolithic. There's only one version of Islam. But with that said... Absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. And here, here's what's said. Forget the Shia Muslim. Forget the the Quran only Muslim or the Ahmed. Forget them. Let's go within his own Sunni tradition. Uh -huh. And he knows this because he claims to be a Salafi. Not only historically, but even now, you have a debate among those who are Sunni Muslims who would either subscribe to the Ashari creed or the Maturidi Maturi creed or the Athari creed on the exact nature of Allah. Does Allah have hands? Or is that metaphorical language? Uh, Does Allah have an actual shin? Or is that metaphorical language? Does Allah have a waist? Or is that metaphorical language? And if he has hands, does he have a right hand, a left hand, or two right hands? Mm -hmm. And when he created Adam, did he create Adam in his own shape of 60 cubits? Or is that metaphorical? And on and on it goes. And not just with Allah. They can't even decide what Muhammad and his companions meant when they said Allah rises above the throne. Allah has hands. Allah has eyes. Allah has a shin. Some say these are actual characteristics of Allah. These are actual body parts, even though they won't call it body parts, but it's unlike anything creation. Others 
who subscribe to the Athari creed or the Maturidi creed, like uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, would say, no, that's metaphorical. When it says the hand of Allah, that's a metaphor for the power of Allah, the strength of Allah, eyes of Allah. That's metaphorical because Allah doesn't have eyes. So you guys can't even <clears throat> figure out what Muhammad and his companions meant when they described Allah in this anthropomorphic language. But then another point, and I know I'm, I'm speaking fast because I'm trying to get as much in because we want to get to all the clips. Another point, Adnan knows that early in Islamic history, there was a battle and a debate over the nature of the Quran. You had the, the Mutazilites, Mutazili, versus the quote-unquote, using Bart Ehrman's term, which he loves to parrot, the proto-Orthodox Sunni group on whether the Quran is created or uncreated. You had a Mutazilite caliph named Ma'mun, and I believe it was in the 800s, who imprisoned and beat any Muslim who would say the Quran is uncreated. He even had Ahmad ibn Hanbal, if my memory serves correct, by the grace of God, thrown in jail and beaten because he refused. Ahmad ibn Hanbal refused to say the Quran is created. And you're telling me that you Muslims are agreed on the nature of Allah and his characteristics? Now that's either a bold-faced lie and he knows it, or he's ignorant about Islam. And if he's ignorant about Islam, he has he disqualified himself for speaking on these matters. Um, that is correct. And uh, there's one more point about what he just said that will be introduced by Alam Ramadan, who said, David, you're doing interpretation. Ironic. So this must mean that uh, Alam uh, watched my video. But notice, Sam, do we have any problem with interpretation? No. We I have mean, no. Bible, everyone. Yeah. Everyone has <laughs> to interpret whatever they're God, reading. Yeah. Allah, right? Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Christians, Muslims, Jews, we all have to interpret our text. Interpretation is what is this text saying, right? When I'm, t when I'm making fun of, uh, of Muslim interpreters of the Quran, and I refer to the miracle of reinterpretation, I'm talking about them taking a verse that is as clear as day and then saying it means the exact opposite of what it says. And the only way you can do that is by a miracle. Right. It's just it's just a, it's just a miracle. It just means the exact opposite of what it said. Right now. Notice, Sam, Adnan just left all of that out. Right. He said, now, David, he gives he speaks for five minutes about uh, these supposed things that we're, you know, interpreting. But that's false. We only uh, we only go with the Quran and we're not free. Unlike Christians, that's when he changes the topic to Christians. Right. And saying that we do all this interpreting over the over the centuries and so on. Yes. Yes. Uh, hmm. Alam, yes, people interpret the scriptures. Yes, that is that is a that is a Christian that is a a huge Christian task. Um, so that is something that we do. When I'm making fun of something that I call the miracle of reinterpretation, that's taking a verse and then just saying it means something totally different from what it actually says, right? Yeah. That is not what Christian theologians are doing when they're trying to put together a precise formulation of the entire scriptural testimony about the nature of God, right? That's difficult work, right? If you put together your formulation, there are other people who are going to come along and say, oh, no, you're leaving this out. Oh, you're not, you're not explaining, you're not accounting for this heresy. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. And so you, you do that. That's something that needs to be done. That's true of Christianity. That's true of Islam. I am not criticizing that. I am criticizing, and this, again, this is the part that Adnan just completely left out, I'm criticizing taking these verses that that are clear in their meaning, and just by a snap of the fingers, you say it means something completely different. And Anan left that, left all of that out, and said that's not what Muslims do. No, we just go with what the Quran says. Well, notice he could not play what I just said and make that claim that they just go with what the Quran says, because if you look at this, I'm not, I don't even remember the examples I gave. I think I gave uh, Surah 929, fight those who do not believe. Muslims, what does that mean? It means only fight in self-defense. Yep. Okay, we know what the verse means. We know what the verse means in context. We know what it means in its historical context and its literary context. It means exactly what it says. The only way you could just make it say something else is by, it's just a miracle, right? It's a miracle. <laughs> the meaning has changed, right? When, uh, when Surah 4, verse 34, uh, Allah says, if you fear rebellion from your wives, admonish them, banish them to beds apart and scourge them, you beat them. Right? And we look at the historical context, and the whole question of the verse was about a man who slapped his wife in his face, and Muhammad wanted to pronounce judgment against the man. Then Allah revealed this verse to say, no, he has the right to do that. 
And then we read the Muslim sources about a, a guy beating his wife until her skin turned green. We read about Muhammad hitting his wife Aisha. What's the verse mean? It means exactly what it says. And we ask Muslims, what's it mean? Oh, miracle of reinterpretation. It means just tap them lightly with the toothbrush. Oh, it's so peaceful, right? That's what I'm talking about. Clear verse, clear in what it means. Let's just make it mean yeah. something else. Now, to be fair, to be fair, there are situations where you could have a verse like that and it could sound clear, but when you read the greater context or when you read the totality of the revelations, that might compel you to reinterpret that. What we're saying, there's, not, there's, nothing in, there's nothing in Islam that changes the interpretation. When we go to the greater context, we see how clearly these verses mean exactly what they say. And the interesting part about what Anan left out there is I really focused on what the Quran says about the Bible. I really focused on what the Quran says about our scriptures. Anan left all of that out and then claimed, oh, no, no, we, ju we, we just go with what the Quran says. Well, let's review. The Quran says that the Torah and the gospel are the inspired word of God. Surah 3, verses 3 to 4. The Quran says that Jews and Christians still had the Torah and the gospel in the 7th century. It talks about us reading them, reading them and finding Muhammad mentioned by name. The Quran says repeatedly that no one can change Allah's words. Right? They, it can't be done. You, you are incapable of changing Allah's words. He's too powerful. Right? And it doesn't say his words in the Quran. It just says his words. Well, guess what? According to the Quran, the Torah and the gospel are his words. Chapter 5, verse 43. Allah tells Jews, you don't need Muhammad. You judge by the Torah. 547. Allah tells Christians, you judge by the gospel. 548. Allah tells Muslims, you judge by the Quran. 568. Allah tells Jews and Christians that they have no ground to stand upon apart from the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to them. I go through all of that, and then leaves all of that out of his video and says, oh yes, David just says that we reinterpret what the Quran says, but that's false. We do not reinterpret. We just go with what the Quran says. Yeah. And his entire presentation is proof that he goes against what his God says because his God affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of our scriptures. And then Adnan's going to spend his entire video attacking our scriptures without showing us yeah. one single verse that criticizes our scriptures. This is amazing, yeah. dude. This is amazing, Sam. Let me just, real quick points. Yes, I just want to confirm. Ma'mun was in the 1800s. He was persecuting those Muslims who said the Quran was uncreated. And when he died, it was his successor, Al-Mutassim, who then flogged and imprisoned Ahmed ibn Hanbal for saying the Quran is uncreated. This is known as the Mihna. So that's number one. So this claim that Muslims only go by what Muhammad and his companions said, and yet they couldn't agree exactly what Muhammad and his companions meant till this day, which is why you have the Athari and the Maturidi and the, and the uh, <clears throat> Ashari. Now, with that said, someone just said to me, so to us, specifically you, David, you're using an outdated word. It doesn't say scour uh, scourge. That's antiqu uh, you know, an antiquated word, and it's That's just right. you're trying beat. to peddle your. You could go with beat. the The yeah. reason I the re the reason I say scourge is because I originally memorized it in the Pickthall edition, so it That's says scourge. What I was, I was if say. you want to go with the other ones, yeah, it, it says beat. Yeah. So the, the standard again, word is beat them. So just remember, Malik, it's not David Wood. It's Muhammad Marmaduke Pikthal, a British convert to Islam. He decided to translate the Arabic word as scourge. Take it up with him when you see him on the Day of Judgment. And finally, there's a brother here, Donald, who said that Christians were first called Christians by supposedly their enemies, and it was a derogatory term. Go to Acts 11.26. Don't take my word for us. Acts 11.26. It says that they were first called Christians in Antioch, Syria, but nowhere does it say they were called Christians by those who are mocking them by way of derogation. It doesn't say that. Let's start, stop reading into the text what the text doesn't say. Nowhere in Acts 11.26 does it say. They were first called Christians by their enemies by way of derogation, a derogatory moniker. It doesn't say that. Let's stop saying it says that for the grace of for the glory of Jesus. So go ahead. What's next? All right. Well, we're going to look a little more into our good friend, Anan Rashid. All right. Alrighty. Here Alrighty. we go. Get ready for it. He's good. He's I'm ready. Gonna, Anan's about to spit some hot fire here. Here we go. Now to David's question. What is he talking about when he says Muslims cannot answer this question? And if they did, I will accept Islam. What is that question? When we claim that the Bible teaches something, they demand an unequivocal statement. No, we do not demand an unequivocal statement for every single thing Christians believe in. That's a misrepresentation of our views. We demand unequivocal statements in the Bible for your core beliefs, for beliefs you hold, and these beliefs are your core beliefs, such as 
the divinity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is God, such as the doctrine of the Trinity, such as the inerrancy of the Bible. And there is a list of these core beliefs Christian hold today that cannot be substantiated from the Bible directly. There is no unequivocal statement in the Bible that substantiates the doctrine of the Trinity, not one. Now, if you were to uh, show Adnan from the Bible, if you were to show Adnan from the Bible, that the Bible affirms the deity of the Father, the deity of the Son, the deity of the Holy Spirit, and that there's only one God, he would say, ah, that's not the doctrine of the Trinity. And then he would go on to go into a bunch of uh, a bunch of very specific formulations and then say, uh, where does it say that? Where does it give this paragraph uh, explicitly? That's just what he does. But he's about to, in the next video, we, we might want to just jump into it. He's, he's about to explain what the doctrine of the Trinity is and then show why this is not actually affirmed in Scripture. Should we just jump into the next one? Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead. By the way, little side note, ladies and gentlemen, notice all of this is in response to me saying, can you give me one unequivocal verse where Allah says in the Quran that the gospel has been corrupted? Yeah. Just one. Can, but, you guys, can you guys give me one? He gives a, an 18 or 19 minute video and uh, and can't give one. But go ahead. And J David, just, just to correct his misinformation, I don't recall you saying that the Muslims demand unequivocal statements for everything we believed. Wasn't it precisely about Jesus saying, I am God? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I was speaking, I was speaking... Uh, the way I said it in that in that portion, I said uh, when when we say something, they say we need we need an unequivocal we need an unequivocal statement. So he's just taking that an extremely like yes anything we say, anything we say, they demand an unequivocal verse. Like if I say, hey, I want a sandwich, I say, ah, give me an unequivocal verse. Yeah, I, I clearly I clearly didn't mean yeah. there was I a context to your statement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, I understand that it's unimportant it's unimportant doctors, but I regarded this one this topic, which he's going to say is is not. Is not a core doctrine, even though it's one of the six articles of faith. Even though it's something where if we take what Allah says seriously, Islam self-destructs. Yes. Even if all of the things that he says we believe in uh, are false, then he's got a problem because his God is affirming the texts that give us what we believe. Yeah. It's something that is absolutely essential in every possible way. It's something where one of one of Muhammad's two main arguments for the uh, for his own exactly. authority was that we are in his, that that he is mentioned in our scriptures. Yep, that's the point. I want them to remember why it's part of his core belief, because it affects the prophet of Muhammad. Muhammad made part of the truth of his prophetic claims, his confirmation of the scriptures, and the scriptures agreeing with his theology and predicting his coming. So you can't tap dance and skirt around that issue. So mm -hmm. let's go into the next clip. And remember, you'll be surprised, David. Let's go. Surprise. <laughs> what is the doctrine of the Trinity? The doctrine of the Trinity essentially means that three persons within the Trinity are co-equal, the Father, the Son and the Spirit are all three equal. They are all three equal. They are equal in status. They are equal in importance. This is what the doctrine of the Trinity constitutes by necessity. Where is that doctrine clearly stated in the Bible? You will interpret, reinterpret, and then reinterpret uh, the reinterpretation again in order to get to that doctrine it is not in the bible this is a core doctrine the christians hold so we are we are in our right to ask for an un unequivocal statement just like you would ask us for a statement to substanti substantiate one of our core beliefs tawhid for example oneness of god the prophethood of uh, the prophethood of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the quran is definitely revealed by god these are core doctrines of the muslims ask us to substantiate these doctrines from the Quran. The Quran says that it came from God. Quran tells us that Muhammad is a prophet of God, he's the messenger of God. The Quran tells us God is one, Allah is one. Okay, These statements are made very clearly in the Quran. So likewise, we ask for, uh, we ask for unequivocal statements uh, about your core doctrines. What's wrong with that? Notice what he just said. Uh, we ask you for unequivocal statements 
of your core doctrines. The Quran says that the Quran is the word of God. The Quran says that Muhammad's a prophet. The Quran says these things that are our core doctrines. Again, ladies and gentlemen, the Quran says that Allah inspired and preserved and holds authoritative the Torah and the gospel. 100%. The Quran rests the prophethood of Muhammad on the reliability of the Torah and the gospel. It says that that's how we know he's a prophet. And, Sam, you know this, that we read yes. yesterday, Surah 10, verse 94, where Muhammad was told by Allah, Surah 10, verse 94, write that reference down, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know it. Surah 10, verse 94, Allah says to Muhammad, if you're in doubt as to that which we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. That's the Jews and the Christians, the people of the book, right? So, Muhammad's prophethood was confirmed by our book, right? So his prophethood rests on the reliability of our scriptures. And I'm not saying, oh, it's not a core doctrine. What are you talking about? Muhammad made it a core doctrine. It's an article of faith. Uh, his prophethood is supposedly confirmed by our scriptures. He says over and over and over and over again that Jews and Christians are supposed to believe in him because we find him in our scriptures. Over throughout the Quran, it's what are you doing? Muhammad's affirming your scriptures. How are you not believing in him when he affirms your scriptures? So Muhammad and Muhammad's own religion, his own revelations depend on whether they agree with our revelations. Yeah, he could exactly. only confirm his revelations. He could only he could only deal with his doubts, according to Surah 10, verse 94. He could only deal with those doubts he was having by making sure that his revelations lined up with our revelations. And by the way, Sam, yeah. notice what it says here. Ask those who read the book before you. <laughs> it doesn't say yeah, go, it doesn't say go read the book. They, Allah knows that Muhammad can't read, so Allah has to say just go ask them and, and go ask them to confirm uh, what I what I'm saying to you. But Sam, here you have yes. Muhammad's prophethood rests on the status of our scriptures in multiple ways, and both he and his God affirm our scriptures. It's one of the articles of faith that you have to believe on. It's on the list of six things that are most absolutely essential for Muslims. And I nod up. Oh, it's not even important. We don't need that. So, we, so Allah doesn't need to be clear about that. Allah can be completely foggy and say exactly the wrong thing. This is amazing. Yeah, but even, even the point that he brought up with Tawheed backfires against him. And Malik here, who's uh, chiming in mm -hmm. with uh, questions that he thinks are relevant, is going to backfire against him. Notice what he said. I want you to catch guy he says if you ask us about tawhid the quran clearly teaches it no it doesn't and here's the deception of the muslims like malik and i hope malik zq is listening because i'm going to turn the tables on him where he asked me to show where jesus made a distinction between being in person as if jesus doesn't make that distinction it is invalid on our part to make that distinction in order to make sense of what jesus and his followers taught but let's let's play that game <clears throat> adnan is a salafi muslim salafi islam have broken down Tawheed into three categories. And I want Malik to hear this and speak for Adnan and try to help Adnan out because Adnan won't be able to answer this either. I want Malik and Adnan, if he's going to do a response to this discussion, show us in the Quran where the Quran explicitly comes out and says Tawheed <clears throat> is to be classified in three categories. There are three categories of Tawheed. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, Tawheed al-Ibadah, right? <clears throat> Uluhiya and Tawheed al-Asma wa Safat. So here's my first challenge. Show me the precise <clears throat> distinction in the Quran where it delineates the threefold classification of your belief of Tawheed. That's number one. Hold, hold up, number two. hang on one second, Sam, before you go on, because uh, it's easy to miss the significance of that in the sense that it is a direct, a direct refutation and uh, of of adnan's methodology yes. namely that uh, you obviously have father being affirmed as god son being affirmed as god spirit of being affirmed as god and uh the the constant affirmation that there's only one god all right so so christians take that and then they have to they have to to sort of get together and say hey how do we formulate these things while taking into account the totality of scripture um how, how do we do that right so what you're saying is Adnan just granted. He just granted. For instance, if you asked us about Tawheed, then we would show you where the Quran affirms Tawheed, just like we could show where the Bible affirms Father, Son, Holy Spirit are, are God and that there's only yes. one God. Do that very easily. 
But he's demanding something much more specific, namely really, really fleshing out all of the details. And what you're pointing out is when later Muslims really fleshed out all of these things in the Quran, they had to come up with all these different classifications and so on. They had to come up with these 100%. concepts and terms in order to to make clear what the Quran is saying. And so if we do not find those things in the Quran, then it just doesn't count. And the Quran is not clear and precise and they cannot give us an unequivocal verse declaring what Muslims actually believe about Tawheed? 100%. That's him now Ouch. taking Ouch. his own criterion and turning it against him. So here's another challenge for Adnan and his followers. Show me where the Quran distinguishes between the essence of Allah, that, and his characteristics, his attributes, what you call sifat. Show me that distinction. Now people will say, well, come on, that's common sense that the essence of Allah will be distinguished from his attributes. No, it wasn't common sense to the Mutazilites, was it? Because the Mutazilites <clears throat> decried anyone who would posit a distinction between the essence of Allah and his attributes because they said, if you do that, then you're positing a plurality of gods. And that's even a modern Shia argument. Just recently, I watched a clip by a Shia cleric saying, we do not differentiate the attributes from the essence because to do so would posit multiple gods. So now I want Adnan to show me from the Quran where the essence of Allah, that, that's the Arabic word, are distinguished from the sifat, the characteristics of Allah, all of which was formulated, argued and debated by subsequent <clears throat> generations of Muslim scholars. In fact, and we got to go to the other clip, here's another interesting point for the Christians here. Not all Sunni Muslims accept the threefold classification of Tawheed. You have Sunni Muslims such as Sheikh Jibril Fuad Haddad. Let me re repeat his name again. Sheikh Jibril Fuad Haddad, who's not a Salafi, he would be more of an Ashari Maturidi, and he's also into Tasawwuf, Sufism. And he decries this threefold classification as an invention of the Salafis. And in so doing, it's it's similar to how Christians came up with the Trinity of God, that this is the Trinity yeah. of Salafism to defy Tawheed into three categories. Him and Nu Ha Mem Keller make the same point. So guys, the very thing that Anan takes for granted is still debated by Muslims till this day, and not Shia, Sunni Muslims who disagree with this threefold classification. Just so uh, we want to thank Adnan for completely destroying <laughs> Islam and uh, especially the Salafi position that he adheres to. Um, thanks. And guys, this is just what happens if you're going to come to us and say, this is our method. And then we turn it around. We say, okay, let's apply it to you. And then your entire religion falls apart. You kind of need a new method here, but you don't want one because you're designing your, your, all of the Islamic methods are designed and based and grounded in inconsistency. Let's apply these things to Christians, but not dream of applying them to ourselves. Well, why can't you come up with some, why can't you come up with any consistent methodology? Sam, I can only conclude here. I can only conclude that Muslims don't apply a consistent standard because if they did, they could not reject our they could not reject what our Bible says. They couldn't do it. Right? So they have 100%. to be they have to be inconsistent and hypocrites. Yeah, and, and, and also shows that demonic influence, that there's something spiritual going on, and may the Holy Spirit set them free for the glory of Jesus. All right, all right, all right. Uh, let me read through a couple of uh, couple of super chats real quick, and then we're going to go on. Gosh, I can't believe it's nine eighteen, and we still uh, we still have a bunch of uh, non clips. Um, all right, we might have to start zooming through some of these. Uh, Atheist seven says science is backed by facts, religions by faith, facts over faith. Science prevails, religions perish. Science works, evidence, rationality, logic. Go science. Um, two things, absolute. <laughs> this is one of the. Guys, if you don't know anything about science and you don't know anything about religion, why are you posting instead of reading? Right? Christianity hmm. is grounded in facts. Jesus died on the cross. That's a fact. Jesus' followers were claiming later on that he had appeared to them in, in, in various ways to numerous groups and to individuals over a period of many weeks. Um, we know that they believed it because they were willing to go to their horrible, bloody death, so they weren't making it up. We know that the tomb was empty. We know all kinds of things that are regarded as facts by historians. Now, we we conclude, based on this, if we do not have a, a, an anti-supernatural bias, we conclude, based on these facts, that he rose from the dead. Right? That's what accounts for the evidence. Other theories don't account for the evidence. Right? So notice, 
our faith, our faith is what we, we, we say, okay, I'm putting my faith in Jesus. In other words, if I'm going to believe someone, if I'm going to believe in someone, I'm going to believe in this guy. Why? Because he rose from the dead. Why do we conclude that he rose from the dead? Because we have facts. So you're, 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 you're putting these two things in these different uh, categories. Even Islam has facts in it. There are facts that we know. <laughs> there are facts that we know. We disagree with the Islamic interpretation, but to, to conclude that religion just doesn't have facts, it's absolute nonsense. And I, I'd say it's pretty idiotic. Second thing I'd like to point out, um, Atheist 7, guess who's responsible for science? Do you know? Do you have any idea? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every single person who was involved in any way in the scientific revolution, the scientific revolution is roughly the period from Nicholas Copernicus to Isaac Newton. That's when, that's the revolution, right? That's when the entire thing becomes, the, the, everything is unfolded in science, right? I mean, you can still learn more things, but that's when everything changes, right? That's why it's called the scientific revolution. By the time you get to Newton, he's figured out the entire universe, basically. Every last one of those guys was a Christian of some sort, right? They were either Catholic, Protestant, or uh, or some sort of uh, heretical person, right? But they all believed in God. They all believed in the Bible. They all believed in these things, right? And if you ask them why they came up with the scientific revolution, if you ask those guys, because we have their writings, we have their letters, we know what they believed, it wasn't just random. It was not just random. It was, what you had was, they basically reasoned that because this universe is created by God, as our religion declares, which we believe on because of Jesus Christ, our religion declares that this universe is the product of a mind and is therefore rational, and God is therefore the architect of this universe, right? Which means that the, there's a mathematical, precise order to the universe, right? Guess what? Science depends on that. Science depends on that. If you're an atheist, why would you think that the universe is governed by these laws? Why would you as an atheist think that if I drop this bottle, it's going to follow a law? It's going to obey an equation. They had a reason for thinking that. They had a reason for thinking that, that everything is going to be run by equations. They viewed God as this cosmic mathematician, right? So that was their belief. Next, you had, uh, you had that they believe that they're created in the image of God that they're different from everything else. They're different from plants. They're different from animals. They're created in the image of God. And what they believe that meant was that we are actually designed with the capability of going out and understanding what God has done. Because if God is this ultimate architect and mathematician and we are created in his image, then we, are, we should be capable of figuring these things out. So they went out and they found that it's actually true, that there are these little, everything is governed by these neat little equations. They figured it out. Notice, they believed ahead of time, based on their Christian worldview, that that is the case. And then all of, all of their investigations confirmed what they believed. And finally, they believed that it was actually good, that it's actually good to understand the universe. Why would you think that it's good? It doesn't matter, right? I mean, in the long, in the long run, what does it matter if you understand, you know, how, what a quasar is? It doesn't affect you a lot. You just have to believe that it's good to know these things. Well, they, they had a reason for believing that, right? They believe that in, in understanding everything that God has done and how what God has done in the world, that they are actually honoring and worshiping God by doing this. And so that was their motivation. Atheists come along later after Christians have laid all the foundation work and after Christians had all of their beliefs. Notice everything about science, they had to believe that beforehand. They had to believe that the universe can be figured out. They had to believe that we're the sorts of things that can figure them out. They had to believe that it's good to know all of this stuff. As an atheist, you have no basis for any of that stuff. Atheists would have never would have never become scientists if Christians hadn't invented it, right? So Christians come out, and then all of those views were confirmed by all of their discoveries. And so what you have is all of science is one massive confirmation of those Christian beliefs that led to them understanding the universe, that led to the entire scientific revolution. Atheism comes along later. And atheism is parasitic. It takes what other people have discovered and then pretends that they're the champions of this thing. And then they throw under the bus the people who actually did all the work and came up with the stuff. What an amazing <clears> stuff. <throat> but anyway, the point was, you have no clue what you're talking about. And instead of Good, commenting, yeah. you should actually do some study. All right, ready sure, for the next clip, Sam? Hold on, wait, 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 real quick. I, because I know we got a lot of ground to cover. I just want to confirm for the Muslims who are shocked to hear me what I just said. Let me just quote what Haddad and Nu. Ha Mim Keller said, it's not long. I just want Christians, this is in my article, and I'll post in the description box. Listen to what they said about this innovation of dividing Tawid into three categories, because Malik ZQ is in his miraj. He's living a fantasy. He's saying, oh, well, you know, okay, let me read what they said. Here it is, guys. This is in one of my articles, quoting from Sheikh Jibril Fawad Haddad, Salafi tamperings of classical texts. Notice what he says. Notice what he says. It is related by Al- 
Harawi from Imam al Shafi that he said Imam Malik was asked about Kalam and Tawheed. So Malik said, It is foolishness to think about the Prophet that he taught this Ummah about Istinja. It's not about rational, <clears throat> philosophical, logical argumentation that would override the so called Naqad, meaning the revelation of Muhammad. Now, just to skip to the point, notice what he says about the threefold class classification Tawheed. This report is true and its meaning. Undisputed. It shows that Tawheed is one, not three. It's splitting into three is one of the innovations of misguidance. Innovation. Isn't that whoa, isn't isn't whoa. that isn't that forbidden by Muhammad? Bidah. Yeah, uh -huh. but now oh, but he made it's even worse, David. He says dividing into three is an innovation of misguidance that created fitna among the Muslims and is reminiscent fitna. of the Byzantine disputations. Now he's saying in so doing this. You resemble the Byzantines, meaning the Christians who divided God into three. So he's likening it wow. to the doctrine of the Trinity. Finally, real quickly, because Malik ZQ, you got Pone, unless you got something to say, run to Adnan and tell him to debate us on this issue. Here, Nu Hamim Keller, who's a convert to Islam. Okay, this is from his uh, 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 post. Questions three, reforming classical texts as far as Wahhabi tamperings with classical texts goes. And notice what he says. Or consider the 73-page intro introduction to volume one of this same translation, a tract that explains the Muslim trinity. You see what he called it, David? He called the threefold classification of Tawheed the Muslim trinity, just like Jibril Haddad implied when he said that this Sam, innovation resembles the Byzantines. I, 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 given that Muslims have other trinities, I think we could make a video called Muslim Trinities because they also have the Father and the Word and the Spirit in the Quran. So yeah. Allah has his two sons and so on. So we could have trinities, yeah, I, man. They've got multiple trinities, man. Yeah, so now, but here's where I want people to see what he says about Ibn Taymiyyah and those who follow him, like Malik ZQ, who's, a, who's an innovator of misguidance. And he's a follower of innovation that leads to misguidance. Notice what he says. Look, look what he says. He clarifies that Tawheed is not one. He's talking about Dr. Muhammad Muskan Khan. Namely, to say and believe the Shah of Islam with complete conviction, as it was from the time of the Prophet until the advent of Ibn Taymiyyah seven centuries later, as new converts might imagine, but must now be three in order to be one, and cannot be one without being three. While such logic may be familiar to converts from Christianity, Imam Bukhari certainly never knew anything of it. So notice what they're saying, innovation of misguidance, and you resemble the Christians in their trinity. Bam, Adnan. Surprise, David. Go ahead. Surprise. Surprise, Adnan and Mufasal. Uh, let me read a couple quick comments here. Uh, Nathan Taylor said, first time uh, talking to you both, but I thank Jesus for your ministry. Keep it up, and many rewards await you in glory through our Lord Jesus. May the Heavenly Father uh, and, and our Lord Jesus Christ continue to bless you. That's Nathan Taylor in the Super Chat. Uh, Walter, in an earlier Super Chat, said, I will send to him now. So that was, uh, he was talking about uh, us helping out uh, uh, Nicholas, who needed help with his medication. Then we have uh, Naeem Chowdhury and John Cass in, with the Super Stickers. Uh, Chris Klaus said, God bless both of you and your families. Uh, Jesus 2020 said, uh, or I guess Jesus 2020 said, God bless Sam and Dave. Chris Klaus mm -hmm. said, uh, God bless you both. Uh, Odishu with the uh, emoji sunglasses, uh, solitary Emmy uh, in the suit with the super sticker. Cool Fox. Uh, mm -hmm. Cheryl R with another Fox super sticker. I've noticed that like, it looks like half of all super stickers are foxes or pears. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Animal says, Muslims, if you want a chance to verbally defend the rapist Muhammad, go to channel the Arabian prophet, prophet. respectful debates are done via Skype, uh, name equals debate TV, uh, write that down. And then first and last says, surprise, David. Uh, Max, <laughs> Max, to, uh, Max to, Tadeo says uh, 100 and Cheryl R, Cheryl R with, uh, with the, the angel emoji. All right, so we'll take a look at a, at a, at a few more in a bit, but I'm ready to go on to this next clip. You ready, right. Sam? Let's do it, bro, let's do it. Anand's about to break it down here. He's going to school you, son. You're going to take shot. Huh? Get in school. The statement must be unequivocal, unambiguous, not open to interpretation, leaving no room for doubt. Why? Because Muslim leaders are professional reinterpreters. They do it with the words of their own God, their own book, their own prophet. Why wouldn't they do the same with our God, our book, our Lord? 
because the demand is give us unequivocal statements in the Bible to support your core doctrines, not doctrines that are not very important, not doctrines that are side doctrines. We are talking about core, central doctrines of Christianity, things you have come to believe in for centuries. For over 1,700 years, Christians have believed in the doctrine of the Trinity. Where is it? Where is the co-equality of the three persons? <laughs> Specifically, co-equality of the three persons in the New Testament. Nowhere. Um, Sam, uh, I don't know if... Maybe Adnan's having a little problem with uh, with interpretation. Um, but notice Adnan's saying, where is the co-equality? Where is the co-equality? Where is the co-equality? Yeah. And so he's looking for a statement. Jesus <clears throat> declareth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal. Right? Yeah. When you could... Guys, if the Bible affirms that the Father is God, and the Bible affirms that the Son is God, and the Bible affirms that the Holy Spirit is God, and the the Bible affirms that there's only one God, and therefore that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God. You're you're telling me that there needs to be a statement saying, and they're 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 equal. What what are you talking? Yeah. About? They're God. They're, they're yeah. the three are the three are one. The three are God. What would you be talking about there? And by the way, Sam. Yes. Didn't the, didn't the early Jews immediately understand that what Jesus said, he was, he was claiming yes. to be equal, right? So, so in, in John chapter 5, they point out, you're calling yourself the Son, you're claiming to be equal with the Father. Right? You're, claiming, you're, you're claiming to be the Son, you're claiming to be equal, right? They understood, wait a minute, if you're claiming to be of mm -hmm. the same nature as God, then you are claiming to be equal, 100%. Right. That's in John 5, 16, 18. And you have done a video on this, right? I recall you did a video, or you're planning to, because I know this came up often in some of our sessions. But I recall you said you're going to, maybe you did, where you broke down John 5. I, I, yeah, I went, through, I went through uh, it as a response to Zachar Knight, because he, yeah. he likes to quote John 5, 30. And so I said, exactly. let's, let's actually read the passage. You can't understand that passage without understanding uh, that that father and son are one in 100%. nature and essence and that they have the same attributes And now notice what Malik did Malik ZQ again who ignored everything I said about him Hopefully he'll will get some of his questions He quotes John 14 28 in order to show that the father is not equal to the son because somehow Don't respond to that because that nun's gonna bring it up Oh, good, good, good. We're going to refute that. But real quickly, what I want to say about John 5, which David alluded to, go listen to his response to Zachar Naik, the video he did on John 5.30 that Zachar Naik misquotes, quotes out of context, because in it, he's going to break it down. You're going to see, and I've done this in my live streams as well, <clears throat> there Jesus claims things that the Quran says only Allah can do. For example, real quickly, go to John 5.25. Well, go to John 5.21. Include that as well. John 5.21. Include verse 25, 28 to 29. Why? Real quickly, Jesus says, just as the Father raises the dead and gives life to whom he, whom he wills, so too the Son gives life to whom he wills. And then he says, the hour is coming, the hour is coming, <clears throat> and it is now where the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will, will live. And then later on he says, the hour is coming where all who are in their graves will hear his voice, the Son of God, and come out. Now, folks, cross-reference that with John 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then go read Quran, chapter 22, verses 6 to 7. Surah Al-Hajj, chapter 22, verses 6 to 7. There, you would think that Muhammad plagiarized the words of Jesus because he says, He is Allah, He gives life to the dead, and the hour is coming, and have no doubt about it, where Allah will resurrect those who are in the tombs. So notice, the Quran says, at the last hour, on the last day, Allah will raise the dead from their tombs, and He is the one who gives life, and it says He is the truth. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the truth and the life, and I am the Son, who at that hour will raise the dead out of their graves by the sound of my voice, His voice, the Son of God. And you're telling me Jesus didn't just claim to be God Almighty, one with the Father, though distinct from Him in person? Are you serious? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so n notice, guys, um, the Jesus' original listeners, they understood based on what he's saying. 
wait a minute, this this guy is claiming to be equal to the father. You have, the, and this, this by the way, this is the real thrust of, of these videos, right? If Jesus is claiming to be God, and he's claiming to be the son, but he's claiming to be the son in a divine sense, and there's only one God, and Father, Son, Holy Spirit are one God, then what do you mean? As far as their nature, they're equal, they're co-equal, they're all God. What are you talking about, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, but notice, Sam, Adnan will look at this and say, aha, but it doesn't say equal. It just, it doesn't say co-equal. It just says they're all God, <laughs> right? And even yeah, though, even though you have in John 5, them understanding exactly what Jesus is saying and going, you're claiming to be equal with God, right? So they understand that. Um, but Adnan, nope, be, you, nope, you need the, you need the specific Satan because it's important. But then you have something like the, the, the nature of the Quran. I mean, what, you know, a, a, apart from, I mean, what's more important than, than their view of the Quran? Because I yeah. mean, even their, even their beliefs supposedly rest on the Quran, right? But what's their view of the Quran? That the Quran is this eternal speech. Well, what verse says, and the Quran is Allah's eternal speech. It's uncreated and so on. That's, that's their understanding they come to that conclusion by saying, well, if this is the case, and this is the case, and this is the case, then this follows from it. Then this yeah. follows from it, right? So they unpack their revelations and their theologians come up with certain ways of describing their beliefs about the Quran. And those are those are essential. Those are those are those are core beliefs. But when we get to our revelations, no, it's ob I mean, it's obvious that. If Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all God, then they are all equal in their nature. They are all equally God in nature, if that's the case. I mean, it's obvious. Anand says, no, I want that statement. Well, Anand, just, just tell us if that is actually your methodology, because we can we can take all kinds of things that are part of core Islamic doctrine. Things that, if you didn't believe them, you would be class, classified as a heretic. And, list those out, and we can list those out over and over and over again and ask you, where it clearly says that, not something that you figured out because of this, this, and that, where it clearly says that. And if it doesn't, then you've got, you, boy, your religion's going to suffer. Now, let me, turn that, let me turn that table against him, uh, against him and the Muslims. And I hope the Muslims are, Muslims, please listen, answer my challenge. Since you want to play that game of unequivocal, here's my challenge, Muslims, prove me wrong. Show me in the Quran where the Quran says in unequivocal, unambiguous language, the Quran is the speech of Allah. I want that sentence. The Quran is Kalam Allah. Explicitly saying the Quran is Kalam Allah. Explicit. I want that reference in the Quran. Now, which Muslim can meet the challenge? Muslims, Malik, ZQ, everyone else. Let me repeat my challenge. Show the Christians here a single unequivocal. I, I was going to imitate Zachary Naik. A okay. single unequivocal statement. Where you'll find if we're saying the Quran is Kalam Allah, speech of Allah. Surprise, David. Now, Christians, hold the Muslims, their feet to the fire, say, we want the verse. Quran is Kalam Allah, speech of Allah. I can show you where the Quran says Jesus is the word of Allah. Chapter 4, verse 171. His word, Kalimatuhu. Show me where it says the Quran, the word of Allah, Kalam Allah. We'll wait for the challenge. Go ahead. Um... <laughs> uh, now, now, now I'm just looking at now I'm just looking at things like this. Muhammad, uh, Muhammad uh, Leban said, uh, and Chung, they're talking about something else. He said, "Let me educate you. This is the Shahada. I testify that there is no god except Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger. Where do you find worship on Muhammad? Well, uh, keep in mind, it's not us. It's it's Quran only Muslims who classify this as shirk, associating a partner um, with Allah. But just notice this. This this is." as essential as anything could be in Islam, this Shahada, that's the first thing you do, and yet it's not even, it's not even in the Quran. That's what's so funny, yeah. <laughs> wow. That's what's hilarious. And you know, it's even more funnier, my brother here said, show us where the Quran is said to be the word of Sauron. Sauron. Isn't that from uh, Lord of the Rings? Sauron? <laughs> Did he say Sauron? Yeah, Sauron. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's good. All right. He, they're not going to find it, Christians. So let's let's rock and roll because he's schooling you, David. After this <clears throat> exposition, expose, I should say, I'm going to make sure you take Shahada because he's schooling you, son. All right. Let's, let's let him school us some more. All right. Gosh, we're already we're on clip eight, and it's we've already been going an hour and forty minutes. All right, here we go. But now that Muslims have presented their standard and unequivocal statement, it would be a shame if we didn't apply the same standard to them. 
It would be a shame if we didn't demand consistency. So let's demand consistency. Let's demand unequivocal statements. We'll start with an easy one. Muslims, where does Allah declare unequivocally in the Quran that the text of the gospel has been corrupted? Give us one unequivocal statement from Allah in the Quran saying that the text of the Injil, the gospel, has been corrupted. Just one. If you can give us one unequivocal statement from Allah in the Quran saying that the text of the gospel has been corrupted, again, I will record myself bowing down and reciting the Shahada. Okay, I will bow down, record myself making the Shahada. Amazing. It is clear now that David Wood does not want to believe in Islam even though it is true. As I already explained earlier, that we are asking for unequivocal statements to support your core doctrines, like the doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus is God, that the Bible is inerrant, it is not, you know, corrupted. For example, you have to prove that. You have to prove that. So this is what we are asking for. And likewise, you can ask us, to support our core doctrines from the Quran, such as the Tawheed. If a Muslim does not believe in oneness of God, he or she cannot be a Muslim. If we do not believe that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a prophet of God, he or she cannot be a Muslim. Or if a Muslim, for example, believes that the Quran is corrupt, he or she cannot be a Muslim. These are core doctrines of the Quran. And we can support these doctrines from unequivocal statements from the Quran. We do not have to produce unequivocal statements for things that are not our core doctrines. So it is very unfair and very, very inconsistent. Um, Adnan says that if someone believes in the corruption of the Quran, if someone believes in the corruption of the Quran, he can't be a Muslim. He said that. Yeah. If someone does not believe in... I mean, if someone believes in the corruption of the Quran, he can't be a Muslim. And he says, you have to believe in the Quran. Wait a minute. It's on the Articles of Faith that you have to believe in all of the, all of the books. Yeah, not just the Quran. Yeah. So why can you believe in... Why, why, do you, why can you not believe in the corruption of the Quran, but you can believe in the corruption of the other books, when Allah specifically declares that all of his books are the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. And if you wanted to doubt one of those, if you wanted to pick one book, Sam, according to according to the Quran, if we yes. wanted to pick out one single book to say it has been corrupted, if we wanted to go to the Quran and say, all right, if the Quran says that any book has been corrupted, which book would we have to pick? You'd have to pick the Quran because according to chapter 15, I hope the Muslims are listening. We brought this up yesterday. Here it goes again. Chapter 15, verses 90 to 91. Chapter 15, verses 90 to 91. I'm going to read the Palmer one, but you can read any one. <clears throat> as, as we sent down, chapter 15, verse 90 to 91, punishment on the separatists, separatists who dismember the Quran. Wow, David. Surprise, David. The Quran has been dismembered. The Quran has been dismembered according to the Quran. Now notice. The Articles of Faith say you have to believe in the books, right? And I'm not saying it's just, just a side issue, but just like the Articles of Faith, the Articles of Faith, they, the, the, same article, the same Articles of Faith that say you have to believe in the oneness of God, say you have to believe in the angels, say you have to believe in the books, say you have to believe in the prophets. Can you be a Muslim? Can you be a Muslim and say, I don't believe in any prophets before Muhammad. Muhammad's the only prophet ever. Can you believe in that? No, you wouldn't be believing. You wouldn't be believing what Allah says. You wouldn't even be believing the, the, the bare bones minimum. Can you be a Muslim and say, I don't believe, I only believe in one book, I, there's never been another book? No, you can't, because then you're not even believing in the one book. Well, how do you even say that you believe in the Quran when Muhammad's prophethood was based, his main argument, if he's talking to Christians and Jews, is I'm prophesied in your scriptures, the scriptures that you have, the uncorruptible scriptures that you have and that are, that are still authoritative for you, that those are the ones that support my prophethood. How do you believe, if you say they've been corrupted, how do you believe that? How do, are you, are you a Muslim? You're not, you're, you're not, you don't even follow the articles of faith. So Anan is saying, Anan is saying, Anan is saying you have to believe, you have to believe in Muhammad. Just think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Why would you have to believe in Muhammad? You could believe in God without believing in Muhammad. 
You could believe in you could believe in Allah. You could believe in uh, you could believe that, that God has sent prophets into the world. You could believe in all kinds of things. Uh, you could even you could even believe in the Quran and just believe that 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 it, it it has nothing to do with this this seventh century guy. The Quran only mentions him by only mentions Muhammad I think four times, and I think three of those could actually be some sort of title. But you could believe those that those verses refer to some other guy, not even not even what Muslims think of as Muhammad. Why is Muhammad essential? Why is Muhammad essential? Um. I think at the end of the day, you just have to say, well, if it's it's been revealed to us that we need to believe in Muhammad. But couldn't you believe in God without believing in Muhammad? Yeah. Couldn't you believe yeah. in following all these rules without following Muhammad? Of course you could. Why is Muhammad essential? Well, it's just part of the religion that Allah has revealed. But that's the same things that say believe in Muhammad also say believe in the books, which is why they're on the Articles of Faith. And the same thing that say that you believe in these books and the book that Muslims believe in affirm the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of our scriptures. Muhammad based his prophethood on it. Again, Surah 10, verse 94, Allah tells Muhammad that in order to deal with his own doubts, he can only do that by going to the people of the book. That's us. That's our book. Oh boy. That's our book. And what's Adnan say? That's just a little side issue no one cares about. Yeah. But then he's not just going to say, hey, it's not important. He's going to go on to attack the Bible, <laughs> to attack the Bible and say that it's been corrupted and completely contradict his God. So the question would be, Adnan, if we cannot trust what your God says about the authority of our book and the history yeah. of our book, and we just cannot trust him, he has no clue what he's talking about. He's ignorant or deceptive. Why would we trust what he says about Muhammad or anything else? We just can't trust your God. All right. Any any thoughts on this? Sam, now, move? David, I just want to chime in because uh, Malik ZQ still doesn't get the point, and he tried to meet Shocker. my challenge. He tried to meet my challenge. Guys, did you see what he just told me to read? Chapter 9, verse 6. He doesn't know that I'm aware of Surah Tatova, chapter 9, verse 6. Guys, listen to Malik. I'm going to embarrass him right now. He said, here's the challenge met, chapter 9, verse 6. There it goes right there. You ask for Kalam Allah. Notice how he lied and distorted my challenge. Let me repeat my challenge, and I'm going to show, you, show him how 9-6 embarrasses him. Guys, you remember what my challenge was? I said, show me in these exact words, unequivocally, the Quran says in the Quran, the Quran is Kalam Allah, to show you the deceit and trickery and the dishonesty and the inconsistency. Here's chapter 9, verse 6. Guys, pay attention to his, who, his meeting the challenge. And if any one of the idolaters ask thee for aid, then aid him in order that he may hear the word of Allah. Kalam Allah. Hear the word of Allah. So now I'm going to challenge him to show me where does it say the Quran is the word of Allah. That was my challenge. Unequivocally, explicitly, Quran is Kalam Allah. That's number one. Number two, I'm going to ask him to challenge me from the context of the Quran that the word of Allah here means the Quran and not the Torah and the gospel. That in the chapter 9, Whoever the person is, he assumes it's Muhammad, Muhammad's name doesn't appear, that it's telling him to let them hear the Quran as opposed to the Gospel and the Torah. Notice how he assumes all this without proving it. Prove to me the Word of God here is not the Gospel, not the Torah, it's the Quran. That's number one. Number two, you still didn't meet the challenge. The challenge is, show me where the Quran says, the Quran is Kalam Allah. You can't find it. Give it up. You're embarrassing yourself. But another Muslim did something even worse. He said, yeah, go to chapter 2, verse 23 of the Quran. Chapter 2, verse 23. There it says the Quran is the word of Allah. Kalam Allah. Okay, let's read it. And if you are in doubt concerning that which we reveal unto our slave, then produce a surah of the like thereof and call your witnesses besides Allah if you are truthful. Did you guys catch what they, this Muslim did? I said, show me where the Quran says, the Quran is the word of Allah. He goes to this showing that the Quran was sent down, and that again assumes it's referring to the Quran. And for argument's sake, I'll, I'll grant that assumption. But notice how now they're proving our point. When we tell them, show us something explicitly, unequivocally, they can't. So they go to passages which they think suffice in answering the challenge without actually using the exact words that I'm asking them to show. But when we show them that Jesus claims to be God without having to say, I'm God, no, that's not clear. That doesn't meet the challenge. It's ambiguous, open to interpretation. There you go, David. Yeah, it's like, uh, it would be like someone saying, um, if someone says, I'm the current president of the United States, Muslims would say, aha, but where did he claim to be Donald Trump? You say, no, 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 <laughs> I'm saying I am the current president of the United States. Aha, but you didn't say the word, you didn't use the words Donald Trump, right? 
That's what they do. Show me where Jesus said, I am God, worship me. And those words, and we show them where Jesus claimed to receive the honors that only God uh, has, that he has the attributes of God, that he has, the, he applies the names of God to himself, that he does the deeds that only God does, that he shares the throne of God. None of this makes any sense if he's just a mere prophet. And the response is, aha, but he didn't use these words. So, so uh, <laughs> we, we, I pointed this out yesterday, right? If Muhammad, I mean, if, 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 if Jesus were an actual Muslim prophet, if Muhammad were right and Jesus was just a Muslim prophet, he shouldn't be saying ambiguous things that sound like he's claiming to be God at all, right? Yep. He shouldn't be saying things that, well, a Muslim can interpret them as him just being a human with a stretch of the imagination. He shouldn't be saying things that could be interpreted as divine claims at all. And yet they're all over the place, right? So... I think you have to say, if Islam is true, if Islam is true, the worst communicators in all of history are yeah. Allah. He's the worst. He's the absolute worst. No question. Yeah. He can't say he can't say what in the world he means. To Muhammad, Muhammad is just a horrible, horrible communicator. Why? Because everything every time I quote Muhammad to Muslims, they say, "Oh, nope, that's not what he meant," and they tell me he meant something else. So he's the worst. Uh, he's second worst. And then the third worst would be Jesus. Because Absolutely. Jesus, according to Islam, Jesus went around. I mean, he started preaching when he was a baby. He spends all these years gathering followers. And by the end of his life, people are, by the time he goes away, people are bowing down and worshiping him as Lord and claiming that he died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. So they just misinterpreted everything. He must be a horrible, horrible communicator. That's what yeah. you have to believe. And notice, Muslims, you claim that your religion honors God, honors Jesus, honors the prophets. And if you dig a little bit deeper, you find absolute blasphemous nonsense and insults against God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what your religion does. Sam, I don't know about you, but if I were to imagine what kind of religion Satan would design yep. for 100%. religious people, for people who by nature want to be religious. There are people who don't want to be religious, but for people yes. who want to be involved in religion, what kind of religion would he design I I would think that he would design a religion that sounds like it's honoring God, but is massively insulting and disrespecting God. A religion that claims Absolutely. to honor Jesus, but is massively insulting and degrading Jesus. That's the sort of religion I would expect. And of course, a religion that completely undermines the core teachings of the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross for sins, that he rose from the dead, Amen. that he is Lord. That's the kind of religion. And that's why when Muhammad came along, Christians could say, my, we've been expecting you, bucko. Yeah, exactly. Muhammad fits the bill of an antichrist to the T. And by the way, David, mm -hmm. Malik ZQ's response is, I need to take a course in formal logic because I don't get his response that chapter 9-6 meets the challenge. So I need to be taught a course in formal logic, David. Hey, hey, Surprise. Uh, uh, hey uh, well, I I've, I've taught formal logic, so um, I, I, think I, could, uh, I think I could help him out. Unless yeah, thank you. I need help. Unless need he's help. unless he's just one of these guys who tosses around logic while while out of, well without understanding. No, he doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's he's I, just parroting words to sound intelligent. Yeah, I don't I don't know if you I don't know if you you know this, Sam, but I, I've seen it among Muslim apologists and Muslim debaters. They'll be spouting off, oh, that's the fallacy of this, that's the fallacy of that. And people mm -hmm. who spent years studying these fallacies and took years of courses of logic. Uh, are listening going, these guys have no clue what these exactly. fallacies even are. They're just saying them because the audience is so ignorant that they don't know what these guys are talking about. Yeah. Sad yeah. stuff. Sad stuff. Welcome to Islam. Uh, a couple comments okay. here. Arlen3 says, uh, seeking Allah, finding Jesus has given flavor to what D. Wood is teaching. Get it. Um, Abraham uh, Tekel in the super chat. Uh, Cheryl R. with the, uh, looks like a chicken super sticker. Sophia, Sophia Film said, as Hijab would say, you're finished. Had not. So, <laughs> Had not. Finish. You'll finish. Uh, Abraham S E C O E says uh, Matthew twenty eight nineteen word of Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Abraham, you don't understand. He said yes. He said baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but he didn't use the word co-equal, and so you just throw out everything Jesus said. Uh, Mikazilla said. Uh, hey, David, keep up the good work, brother. Love you too, Sam, even though you are shameless. That is the shameless. best comment of the day. A uh, couple more from uh, Sophia Film. Sophia Film said, thanks to singlemuslim.com for the ad. <laughs> you guys get an ad for single Muslim? 
I, I, I'm impressed that there was an ad at all on my, on my videos. Uh, Truth Seeker uh, with the super sticker. Tippy Bear with uh, the heart and looks like some popcorn. Uh, Cheryl R with the bird. Tippy Bear with the 100. Um, Sophia Films. Allah bribes Muslims with women and wealth. Certainly does. Certainly does. Um, just a, ma a matter of fact, Sam, that's the other thing. If, oh, yeah. if I were to imagine what religion Satan would invent... It would be one not only that tells you you're honoring God and honoring Jesus when you're completely insulting God and degrading Jesus. Uh, it would appeal to that side of man, which is fleshly carnal desires, carnal, but, filthy, put, but put God's stamp of approval on them to say, hey, yeah, you get to do all the things that other people are doing. You get to go around and take women and rape them and have sex with a little girl and all this stuff. But God says it's halal. It's, it's good. It's a good thing to do. Um, hey, hey, and here's what's funny. Um, Isaac Cruz said, <laughs> I guess he came in in the middle, but Isaac Cruz said, I just watched this. I just watched this response video from someone named Adnan Rashid, where he <laughs> failed to answer David's question, but spent 20 minutes dodging it. <laughs> now, yeah, now how did Isaac get this when the Muslims who are watching Adnan don't get it, right? How does Isaac watch this video and go, wow, I spent 20 minutes watching this and he doesn't actually give what David yeah. asked for. He can't give one, one example. Why can't he do that? Isaac watches that and realizes, well, wow, Adnan spent the entire video dodging the question and, and, and hitting every other topic he could come up with, but, but without addressing the actual topic. And he, Isaac gets this, but the Muslims watch it, and it's like, the, it's like they're not paying attention, but they assume that he said something that refutes us. Anyway. Spiritual, buddy. I told you it's spiritual. There's demonization, and only the Holy Spirit can set them free for the glory of Jesus, bro. All right, let's uh, let's keep let's keep let's keep moving on. My goodness, so many so many so many clips from Adnan. Let's keep going. And what is David trying to do here? What he's trying to do is he's trying to take attention away from a very important matter. The matter is again, we want unequivocal statements from the Bible to support your core doctrines, such as the doctrine of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Is he God? Where does the Bible say that? Where did Jesus say that? What we do have, to the contrary, statements, unequivocal statements where Jesus says that he is not God. For example, the Father is greater than I. Therefore, the Father is not equal to the Son or to Jesus Christ. And this is the verse origin, an early church father from the 3rd century used to argue that Jesus is a subordinate to the Father. Jesus is lower to the Father because of this verse. Right? So early Christian church fathers were arguing in this way. And he was later on called a subordinationist for that belief. Well, Sam, there you have it. Yeah. So when he talks about, he finally explained what he means by unequivocal statements. And he said, an unequivocal statement like we have when Jesus said, the Father is greater yeah. than I. Now, he's going to go on to give more in the next clip. But uh, I would take that as a paradigm example of a verse that you need to read in the context of other things Jesus said, and especially in the context of the passage. What do you think, Sam, is, yeah. is uh, John 14, 20? And here, uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't Malik bringing this up before? Yes, he did. Okay, and so Malik was bringing this up. Go ahead. Remind people, you actually recorded me doing, I think, close to a 13-minute discussion on John 14, 28. Do you remember? That was like 10 so, years ago. Yeah, so we still have that. It's online. It's still there, John 14, 28. But now, and by the way, for those of you who <clears throat> are Muslims, do issue this challenge to Adnan on my behalf. Say, Sam Shum would like to debate you on two topics. Does the Quran teach Tawheed, and does the Bible teach the deity of Christ or the Trinity? But it's got to be two separate topics. Now, with that said, number one, John 14, 28. Let me read the context, folks. I mean, we've done, we've addressed this over and over again, you know, but again, let's do it again. John 14, 28. You heard me say to you, I go away and will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So he says, rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. That statement will only make sense when you read it in its immediate and overall context. But First off, if you want to know what Jesus did not mean when he says the Father is greater than I, he doesn't mean the Father is better than me ontologically. That the Father is God, I'm not, I'm a creature, so he's infinitely greater, better than me. How do I know that's not what the Lord is saying? In the same chapter, 
John 14, verses 12 to 14. John 14, 12 to 14. I'm just going to stick with the same chapter. And by the way, it's ironic. This is the very gospel that begins by introducing Christ as the eternal, uncreated word of God the Father, the one who created all things and brought all things into being, who gives life to all things, who became flesh for our redemption. But let's ignore the prologue and assume that John is going to contradict himself some 13 chapters later. But with that said, John 14, verses 12 to 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. Guys, pay attention to that. This is John 14, 12 to 14. You will do greater works. Same Greek word, same English word. It's my zone in Greek. The works I do, you'll be doing, but you'll be doing greater works than these. Now, Jesus cannot mean that you're going to be doing better miracles than me, <clears throat> works that are superior in quality than the works I've been doing. He clearly means you're going to do the same works I've been doing, but a greater number. So right here in the chapter itself, the word greater doesn't mean something or someone who's greater, that's greater in <clears throat> quality, ontologically, but greater in volume, in number, in position and status. But now he explains why. Folks, he explains why they'll be able to do greater works than he's been doing because I go to the Father. So the first question Christians should ask, what's the connection between the disciples doing greater number of the same works that Jesus did while he was on, our, on earth and him going to the Father? 13 and 14 gives you the answer. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So Jesus says, when I go to the Father, that's when you'll ask in my name, and I from heaven will hear your prayers, and I will be the one doing the works through you per your request. Now, before I comment on this, John 14, 23, same chapter, John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, if a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So, folks, let's break this down. Jesus just said he's the hearer of prayer. Pray, I will answer your prayers. And Jesus claimed to be present personally with every true believer to the same extent and to the same degree that the Father is present with every true believer. This assumes that Jesus must be omnipresent for him to dwell in communion and fellowship with every true believer. He must be omnipresent. He must be omniscient. He must know who the true believers are from the fake Christians. And he must be omnipotent, all-powerful, in order to be able to answer all requests, no matter how many people are asking him, no matter where they're at and what those requests happen to be. By golly, last time I checked, to be omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and to hear a prayer makes you God. But now notice, folks, though he's claiming the attributes of God, the functions of God, he's still not the Father. He's distinct from the Father, and yet one with him in the Father's ability to do the very things that Jesus says he can do, which are things that only God can do. And this is the chapter you want to quote to try to prove that Jesus is saying the Father is better than me in essence? No. It means the Father is greater in terms of status because while Jesus remains on earth, he's in a state of humility. He's assumed the status of a servant. And he's saying to them, if you love me, you'll rejoice because as long as I remain here, the Father will be greater in status. But when I go to the Father, that will change. Now, how do I know that will change? John 17, verse 5. And now, Father, glorify thou me in thine own presence with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Two points. Jesus says, glorify me in your presence. When I return to heaven, the glory you possess is the glory you'll bestow on me in your presence. And secondly, that's the glory I had already with you before the world was created. So Jesus affirms two things. He was there personally alongside the Father before the creation of the world. And he was there alongside the Father in the same glory. And that's the glory he set aside, but he'll regain. And that's what he meant. If I remain on earth, the Father is greater in status because the Father is in heavenly glory. But when I go to the Father... I'll no longer be in the state of humiliation where sinners beat me and whip me to the point of death and nail me to the cross. I'll be basking in the same glory of the Father where all the inhabitants of heaven will behold my glory and know 
I'm the son of God who's one with the father. And then finally, this passage proves that Islam is false and Muhammad is an antichrist. Why? Because Jesus said the father and he's the son who shares the same glory that the father possesses. All of which Muhammad denied because Muhammad said Allah is not the father. Jesus is not the son. So thank you, Adnan, for quoting a verse that proves Muhammad is an antichrist under the wrath of Christ. Thank you, David. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I understand this program is going long. We have already gone two hours, but we still have over 1,600 people. So I think we're just going to keep going and uh, and get through Adnan's uh, points rather than splitting it up into multiple shows. Um, I don't like doing shows that are uh, doing live streams that are two and a half, three hours long. But for anyone who is interested in um, in seeing whether Adnan really has a good case, then this will be there for them. Sam, I did want to add something uh, to that. Uh, that whole that whole discussion in John 14 uh, starts off with Jesus, as far as I can tell, putting on a little play for mm -hmm. his followers. So we read John chapter 13. Jesus puts on this little this little display for everyone. Now watch what happens, ladies and gentlemen. He says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During, su during supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come for forth from God and was going back to God, knows Jesus, knowing that where he had come from and where he's going back to, where he's about to go back to, got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. He got up from supper, he gets up, he goes, he takes, uh, he takes away his normal garments, puts those aside, wraps himself in a towel. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand later. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet, right? That, that was considered a, a slave's work. Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Now notice that part. When he had washed their feet and taken his garments again and reclined at the table, then he said, do you know what I've done to you? Think about what Jesus does here, right? Because this whole passage, this whole passage that's about to follow this, is about Jesus lowering himself into the world so he could do the work that he came to do and then return to where he was before. So notice what Jesus does right in front of his disciples. He takes off his normal clothes, wraps himself in a towel, and becomes like a slave who would wash your feet in someone's house. Then he washes their feet, and then he goes back and he puts his normal garments back on and says, you understand what I just did? Right? What's going to what's happening in the rest of this passage, as Sam's pointed out, is Jesus is saying, guys, do you really uh, have you not figured out where I came from? All right. He's claiming he is the way and the truth and the life. He entered this world because he had some stuff to do. Then he says he tells them that he's going away and all his disciples are broken up. Oh, no, he's he's going away. We can't understand. What is this? What does this mean? And he's saying, look, don't you know if I go away? I'll be able to answer your prayers. Why? He's going back to where he came from, right? He's, in other words, he had his status, his eternal set, sta his eternal status, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then he lowered himself, taking on the degrading form of a servant, just like he did in the little play before that, taking on the degrading form of a human servant, and then he tells his followers, "Guys, I'm leaving. I'm going back," and they're all broken up, and that's when he says. If you loved me, you'd be happy because my father is greater than I. In other words, I told you I'm going back where I came from to the father. 
you should be happy because look at me in this state. If you really, really loved me, you would want me to be in my exalted position where I am Lord and I answer your prayers. You would be happy at that. Instead, you're all upset. It's like you'd rather keep me here than having me glorified with the glory I had Amen. from before the foundation of the world. How could, what, what's your problem here? So notice, ladies and gentlemen, that entire passage makes no sense if Jesus is a merely human prophet. It makes no sense. That passage makes no sense if Jesus is, the, is not the divine son. It makes no sense. Adnan and those who are like him go to uh, chapter 14, verse 28. They don't quote the passage. They don't quote the chapter. They don't quote the context. They take one little part out where Jesus says, the father is greater than I. Ignore what that means. Namely, I've lowered myself and degraded myself to, to, to come in this human form. But now I'm going back and you should be grateful because now I'm going back to where I belong. And they say, oh, you see here, this is this is unequivocal. This is an unequivocal hmm. verse where Jesus is claiming to be just a human prophet and he's not Lord. This yeah, is amazing. Yeah. I mean, this is absolutely amazing. This is what these guys mean by an unequivocal verse? Yeah, that backfires proves Muhammad is an antichrist. And I just want to share a praise report with you, David. Hmm. Al Camo Lozano said, I've learned a lot of things today that made me strengthen my Christian faith more in the risen Lord, that is Jesus Christ. Thank you, and God bless bless both of you. So glory to God, that's what we want to do. Strengthen the brethren by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Malik ZQ, I answered you twice already, I'm gonna answer you a third time. He's saying, would I debate Ijaz? I'll debate you and Ijaz on the same night, in the same venue, set it up, because it'll be your decimation. decimation. So hopefully you got your answer. Um, hey, Sam, since you're giving praise reports here, let me give a, let me give a fun one to everyone. <laughs> I got this in the in the email right before right beforehand. I normally don't share the messages from uh, from from emails, uh, but uh, we get these too. Uh, Dear David and Sam, I can see that you are on tonight. I will try to be there and listen. I enjoy following you guys. And by the way, thank you because of you and Sam. I left Islam back in two thousand seven. Amen. So this is back when we were just writing. This is before we were doing YouTube stuff, really, right? Amen. So this Amen. is when we were just writing articles. So he, he even says, he says, I came across Answering Islam and other good sites. After my apostasy, I decided to take the fight to Al-Qaeda and their like-minded, which gave them a huge blow. I worked for almost six years for the Danish, British, MI5 and MI6 and the CIA. The Spy Museum in D.C. made a permanent exhibition of my work. Uh, guys, you have a share of my fight. Without your hard work, uh, it would not have Amen. been possible for, for as many... Oh, he said, uh, without your hard work, I would possibly have been killed as a terrorist or in prison. Um, and he goes on to... He says, I sent you a link to my CNN documentary. The documentary is about this guy. It's about this guy who was known as a convert to Islam. He left Islam, but didn't announce that he left Islam. And then he basically went to uh, to these organizations like the CIA and stuff and says, hey, everyone knows me as a convert. So if you want me to infiltrate anything, I have a good reputation as a convert. Praise and God. infiltrated yeah. Al Qaeda. And Glory so there, Jesus, again, this is a this is a uh, this is a, a CNN documentary. You got the whole you got the whole I think it's a 45 minute documentary on this guy who infiltrated Al Qaeda. But that's the message I got for anyway. Um, Probably uh, I'm gonna invite this guy on the uh, to come on a live stream. Um, I would normally I would normally think that someone would want to lay low and not be vocal about it, but he's got I mean he's got his documentary there on C on CNN. So if he if the story's out, then uh, yep, I invite him on here. Uh, if you want to come on, we'll uh, we'll talk about it. You can share more information. All right, so Sam, we've seen Adnan's notice. Sam, notice notice the request. <sighs> Adnan. Muslims of the world, can you give us one unequivocal verse in the Quran that says the gospel has been corrupted? No, we can't, but we can change the subject 375 times. And now he's on the topic of an unequivocal verse which shows that Jesus isn't God, when if you actually read the passage, you cannot, you cannot understand that passage without Jesus being God, who exactly. became incarnate, which is exactly, which is exactly how the gospel of John begins, right? Yeah, the word became... 100%. Flesh and dwelt among us, and Jesus is saying, "Hey, now that I'm flesh, because I've become flesh, now I'm going back to where I was, and you are all upset. You should be, you should be happy. Guess where I'm going? Wow, it's amazing. All right, we're ready to keep going. Up to you, bro. I'm here. As long we as we got to do it, we got to do it. We got to do it. We got to get through this. Uh, yeah. It's my, it's my, my main task <laughs> in life to get through this. All right, here we go. All right, let's do it now. Another statement Jesus made unequivocally where he said that he is not God. He said, why 
callest me thou good when there is no one good but God here Jesus is simply telling you that he is not God he is simply not God this is unequivocal this is very very straight hey, by the way, in another verse Hatun. John just chapter 17 verse. verse 3 where Jesus says let that me pause this Sam we can hear everything you're saying oh sorry yeah. I apologize your, your, I apologize. your, your mic remains on and you're sitting here complaining about people. No, no. No, someone blasphemed the Lord. He said uh, that when you quoted that story about him being a servant, uh -huh. it was Jesus gay. He removed his outer garment, washing men's legs. So oh, really? Who said that? David, Who said that? Who said that? Pigeon, Pigeon Hatun. And he says, and you, David, and Sam, live in a G-string? That's Pigeon Hatun. That's why I said, what a blasphemy. He okay. says, so you're trying to prove that Jesus is gay? That's why. I'm sorry, guys. I yeah, didn't mean to be that's blockable. And, uh, now, no, no, now notice, he just he just called. So this is, uh, is this guy a Muslim? He's well, obviously, but he's hiding under a name because he doesn't okay. want us to go after Muhammad. And, and notice what we just said earlier, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, guys, th th those of you who've been following the discussion, is is Pigeon a Muslim or is like an atheist blasphemer or something like that? Yeah, Pigeon Hatun. He even calls himself Hatun and mocking Hatun Tash. Yeah, guys, uh, those of you who've been commenting, just tell us, was was that a Muslim? Because if it was, I mean, think in mind, he's, he's calling Jesus gay. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry um, about that. That's why I didn't mean to talk over. But when I read it, it was so disgusting to say that. I that's, mean, why, I that's why you said blasphemous pig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we heard you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, guys, those of you who've been following the discussion, was he? Was he, do you know what he was? I haven't been. I've been. been haven't been following the comments of yeah. Pigeon uh, Two. Warrior uh, woman uh, says. Warrior Muslim. woman said Muslim. Yep. Yeah. Notice, guys. Notice what we were saying earlier, right? How this this religion. Um, this religion claims to respect Jesus, claims to respect God, and then, it, but it's just filled with this kind of blasphemous stuff. And notice, if you want to say, "Oh, Je Jesus changed his clothes, therefore he's gay," that's what this Muslim just said. Uh, notice, I mean, if you if you read the Muslim sources and you read, you know, you read one of the hadith or something like that about um, about Moses taking off his clothes or something like that, then you, he, he would have to say that that therefore Moses was gay or something like that. You, can you even imagine this? Can you even yeah. imagine this religion? Unbelievable. Man? All right. Unbelievable. All right, sorry All right. about that, guys. That's why I reacted, because you insulted the Lord Jesus, holy, right. pure Son of God. Go ahead. Well, well before Sam uh, ruined that clip, let's watch it again, because Anand's <laughs> going to give more examples of unequivocal statements. Now, another statement Jesus made unequivocally, where he said that he is not God. He said, why callest me thou good, when there is no one good but God? Here, Jesus is simply telling you that he is not God. He is simply not God. This is unequivocal. This is very, very straight. In another verse, John chapter 17, verse 3, where Jesus says that Father is the only true God. Father is the only true God. So problematic was this verse for the Christians that St. Augustine in, uh, in the... In the in the fourth or fifth century when he was writing his homilies in his commentaries uh, called his homilies he actually changed the words of this particular verse he changed the words of this particular verse in his commentary because this particular verse john 17 verse 3 was very very problematic for the trinitarian church fathers so this is what we mean by unequivocal statement where Jesus clearly denies his divinity in the New Testament. This is why we ask as to where are these statements. So we are very, very fair and just in asking for those statements. <clears throat> you are the loudest typer I've ever heard in my life, Sam. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I was hearing you type too, but it's all right. It's no, I know. It happens. Um, so Adnan gives two examples. One. Well, we already dealt with 1428, but then he gives two more of unequivocal, unequivocal. Uh, yeah. And now he has, what Jesus says, uh, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God. And he says that is an unequivocal verse. So notice, according to Adnan Rashid, Jesus was denying his own goodness. This is interesting. I find this interesting because I didn't, I don't interpret that verse at all that way. So if it's unequivocal, and yet it's not how anyone I know would, in, anyone I know would interpret it, then he has to explain how we're all getting this wrong for a verse that cannot be misinterpreted. So according to Adnan, yeah. Jesus said, um, uh, why do you call me good? So someone comes up to him, calls him good. He says, why are, you, why are you calling me good? There's only one good, and that's God. Yeah. Sam was... Uh, yeah. So notice... Yeah, I'm about uh, to take shahada, bro. Uh, he schooled you, David. Yeah. I told you don't go there. I'm about to take shahada, man. See what you did to me? So Jesus... 
who called himself the good shepherd, yeah. Jesus, who asked, who could, which among you can convict me of sin? Jesus, who is sinless according to the Bible and according to the Quran and according to Muhammad in the Hadith, the only the only man ever that Satan could not touch. Satan could touch Muhammad, Satan could touch everyone, but he could not touch Jesus. Adnan Rashid believes that Jesus there is unequivocally saying that he's not good. He's not good because there's only one good, and that's God. Now, Sam, what, yeah. what do you think of that? Is, is, uh, is, is, that yeah. is that an unequivocal passage? That's it. It's over for you, bro. You need to now face the East and take Shahada. But all kidding aside, because this appears in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and I went by that order because he follows <clears throat> the trend of consensus of New Testament scholarship. Mark is the first. Let's read it in context. See, we love context. I'm not afraid of reading context. So he quotes Mark 10, 17, 18. We'll go with the Mark inversion. Why do you call me good? For there's none good but God alone. And then he says, you know the commandments, and he mentions the last six. So then the rich man says, guys, pay attention to the context. He goes, I have kept these since I was a youth. What do I lack? What do I lack? Okay, I've been doing that since I was a youth. What do I lack to obtain eternal life? Because he's asking Jesus, how do I obtain eternal life? Now watch this. Mark 10, Mark 10, 21. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him, and he said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. So give up your riches, which are an idol, for me. Give up everything for me. Follow me. Now, that's not the point to show that Jesus is not denying his essential goodness. It's what Jesus goes on to say, because he tells the disciples, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man enter heaven who trusts in his riches, because he loves his riches more than God. So now this prompts the reaction of the disciples. Now notice what they say, Mark 10, 26. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? All right, if it's like this, that means it's humanly impossible to be saved. Now notice what our Lord says. This is the same chapter, Mark 10. Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So I want to repeat this, and I'm going to come to you because you're, you're the logician. Men cannot save themselves. That's humanly impossible. God alone can save men because God does what is humanly impossible, impossible for men to do. So then Peter says, lo, we have left everything and followed you. What you asked of that rich man, you asked him to give up his riches, follow you. We already did that. We gave up everything for you, Jesus. We gave up our families for you, Jesus. Now, what does Jesus say? Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Because you gave up everything for me, here's my promise. You will receive eternal life. That's the first point. But then a the second point, Mark 10, 45. Remember he said, with men it is impossible for men to save themselves. God alone can do that, what is impossible for men, save mankind. Mark 10, 45, here's what Jesus says. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, David, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Help me understand what Jesus just said. Jesus said, keeping the Ten Commandments, the last six, is not sufficient for eternal life. You have to give up everything. Give up your family, your possession, <clears throat> your, your own life, and follow me. Give it all up for me, and I will then offer my soul as a ransom to save many lives. But didn't Jesus just say, it is humanly impossible for a man to save, <clears throat> save himself, let alone someone else. But how can then Jesus do what is humanly impossible by guaranteeing all his followers who give up everything for him, their money, their, their property, their children, their spouses, their own lives to follow him. And then he will offer his life as a ransom to save them if Jesus is less than absolutely good and simply a human creature, because then he just say, with men it's impossible, only God can do that? Uh, yeah, and uh, according to Adnan, Jesus wasn't even good. So, I mean, how, what, what sort of ransom can he be if he's not even good? Right, and that's confirmed by Psalm 49, 7 to 9, David. Same Bible, Psalm 49, verses 7 to 9, confirming what Jesus said, with men it's impossible. Men cannot save themselves. 
With God, nothing is impossible. Because notice what Psalm 49, verses 7 to 9 says. 7 to 9 says. Psalm 49, 7 to 9, folks. Truly, no man can ransom himself. But what did Jesus say? The Son of Man will offer his soul as a ransom for many. But the psalmist says, truly, no man can ransom himself or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of his life is costly and can never suffice, that he should continue to live on forever and never see the pit. That's why in verse 15 it says, Psalm 49, verse 15, But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. David, help me understand this. Man, I'm really confused. Jesus just said, I, the Son of Man, I, the Son of Man, will offer my life, my soul, to ransom many lives, many human lives. The very thing Jesus said was humanly impossible to do. The very thing the psalmist says no man could do. Help me understand, David. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if if I were a Muslim and I, I really actually cared about consistency and and uh, and uh, unambiguous verses and so on, I might want to take a closer look. I might want to take a closer look at all of this and see if uh, my Muslim belief that Jesus was not good, even though he was sinless and called himself the good shepherd. Uh, if I'm being if I'm applying my my methodology consistently here, because, again, Adnan calls this unequivocal. Yeah, and by the way, let's bring out the implication of that, because again, we got so much into refuting it. What Jesus is basically saying to the rich man, if God alone is good, and you think I'm good, then that means I'm God. So you're now willing to give up everything for me and follow me as your God. That was Jesus's point, because yeah, notice guys, he didn't say, I'm not good. Yeah, notice, and, that, and, that's, and, that, and that's how Muslims always misrepresent it. They say, ah, Jesus said he's not good, only, uh, you know, only, only God is good. Again, this is a guy who is sinless, according to... Both yeah. Islam and Christianity. This is a guy who called himself the Good Shepherd. Why would he be denying his own goodness? He doesn't deny his own goodness. He asked a question. This guy comes up to him. Good teacher. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why are you calling me good? Do you actually understand something here? What? Why are you calling me good? That's what he says. Why are you calling me good? Only God is good. Do the math, guy. Am I good? Exactly. Like you said? Am I? Am I good? Yes or no? Am I good? Okay, only God is good. <laughs> Let's do the math here. <laughs> um, so notice, notice what, it, what what Adnan did. I mean, what Adnan did is exactly what he did, what he did, in John chapter fourteen, verse twenty-eight. Right? He took a he took a little snippet of something Jesus said, completely ignored everything else Jesus said and the implications of everything else he said. Right? Now, again, guys, I understand that there are times when. You look at a verse, and a verse sounds like it's saying one thing, and so you have to look at the bigger picture. That's that's true in Islam. That's why, that's why when when the Quran says that the the you know the 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 scriptures of the Jews and Christians are the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God that can't be changed and are still authoritative. That's why we ask, can you show us something that will make us rethink our interpretation of that? Is there something else that outweighs those? Is there a clear, unequivocal verse? where he says something else and he says, actually, no, 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 the gospel has been corrupted. That's why we ask for that, right? Because if you have all these clear statements and they're all pointing in one direction and all Muslims believe that they're pointing in the opposite direction, we have to ask, what's the basis for you saying that that our scriptures are corrupted? What's the basis for it? You're not get, are you get, I, I, we can't see how you're getting it from God, right? So we understand there are verses that you can take out. You can, you can take a verse, look at it. It can sound like it's saying one thing, but you have to think about it. How does it, how, if I interpret this in the light of other things Jesus said, Again, same with the Quran. If I interpret this verse in the light of everything Muhammad or Allah said, what do I get? Does it change the meaning here? And so you've got these verses. And uh, Sam, a Muslim would never allow us to treat the Quran like this. Uh, no if way. We went they to the would... Quran. Yeah. Completely destroyed and, and completely destroyed the meaning of a passage by ripping a ripping a passage, ripping a verse or a quote out of context. They lose their minds and call us deceivers forever. But that's what yeah. their top apologists do constantly and endlessly with the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Then let me just remind the Christians how not to interpret the Bible. This is important for the Christians more so than the Muslims because they're going to desecrate our scriptures until the Holy Spirit convicts them. Christians, remember something. Mark 10 is not the beginning of the gospel. Nine chapters precede it. That means you Christians who love the Lord, love his word, must read Mark 10 in the context of the nine chapters that came before it. And why is that important? Folks, Mark 1 verse 11. God the Father breaks into time and space and speaks in an audible voice saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. 
I am well pleased with him. God is not well pleased with someone who's less than absolutely good. That's number one. Number two, Mark 1, 23, 24. A demoniac sees Jesus, falls before him, says, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? For we know who you are, the Holy One of God. The Holy One of God. Chapter one. The Holy One of God. Oh, but he's less than absolutely good. And that's chapter one. And then we add the final thing, because we don't want to belabor this point. Mark chapter 2, Jesus sees a paralytic. Mark 2, verses 1 to 12. This is in the first two chapters, let alone that Mark begins his gospel of identifying Jesus as the Job of the Old Testament. Put that aside. In Mark 2, verses 1 to 12, Jesus sees the paralytic, sees their faith, and trying to bring the man to him. And he says, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And the people there say, Why does this fellow speak this way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And then Jesus, immediately in his spirit, knew this is what they're reasoning with them themselves. And he goes, why do you have such thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you? Or rise, pick up your man and walk, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins on earth. I say to you, rise, pick up your man and walk, and immediately God healed. How can he be less than absolutely good if he has the power to do what only God does, forgive sins? He's the Holy One of God, whom the Father is well pleased with. Come on, man, give yeah, me a so, break. So you might you might want to say the entire uh, the, the entire thrust of the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is good, and then someone calls him good, and Jesus says, "Why are you calling me good? You, you know, only God's good, right?" Yep. And then what's the conclusion for, for Adnan? Well, Jesus is denying his own goodness. He's a baddie. <laughs> All right, uh, Sam, and then the other one that Adnan brought up was uh, John 17, 3, uh, which, which, by the way, I have to point out, I have to point out, is just two verses before John 17, 5. Which we already mentioned. Yeah, which, yeah. We, which you mentioned already, where Jesus said that he uh, had glory with the Father before the world began. So... Yeah, and let me just add a couple more points. Like I got, uh, folks, these are the same tired arguments we've responded on our YouTube channel and articles. But let me show you what Adnan forgot to read in context again. John seventeen three. Either Jesus is saying, remember, this is the same Gospel of John that begins, and I have to repeat this like a broken record, that begins the Gospel by affirming Christ is the eternal, uncreated Word of God, who is fully God in essence who created all things, gives life to all things, who became the flesh and blood, Jesus of Nazareth. So forget the prologue. John doesn't know what he's talking about. He contradicts himself. Okay, put that aside. Let's read verses 1 and 2. When Jesus had spoken these words, John 17, verses 1 and 2, folks. <laughs> oh, boy. Shoot. Yeah, anyway, I shouldn't and, be shocked. I should expect and, this. And, yeah. and no, yeah. this comes after everything we mentioned about John 13 through 16, where Jesus yeah. is claiming that he's the way, the truth, and the life, that he's the one who answers prayers, that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father, all of these things, which cannot be which cannot be interpreted, that he's the one, he's the one who's going to, who, along with the Father, will send God's Holy Spirit. Um, this comes after all of this. Well, that's Muhammad, man. That's Muhammad. Shame on you. Yeah. So this comes after all of that. And then, of course, Adnan's going to go to uh, verse 3 of chapter 17. Completely ignore what came before it. Completely ignore what comes after it. And, uh, yeah. Welcome to let me, Now, let me let, let me look at the two verses to show how backfires against real quick. Because, we, we, again, we got a lot more clips. We may not get to them, but God willing. Oh, we're when Jesus to... had spoken. Okay, good. We're going to have to burn through them, but, yeah. All right. Well, this one I have to do, because I think this is the meat of his arguments, this is, and they're going to go back. Oh, oh yo, right, Sam, 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 yeah. let, just, let just let me point this out to everyone. Guys, I know we're going long, but apparently those of you who are watching are interested in this stuff. Uh, this will be, um, we'll try to finish, we'll try to finish within the, you know, the next 30, or 30 minutes or so, but we do want to get through all of the clips. Uh, but since this is such a long video, I know that lots of people are not going to click on a three-hour video. I'm not going to click on a three-hour video, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but... If you see something in here that you like, right? You see a response to an objection that you like, you are all welcome to download the video. Like if you like Sam's response to, you know, John 14, 28, and you like that, feel free to download that portion, that clip, and post it on your own channels as a separate video. Title it well so that people know this is a response to this objection. Yep. So with that said, let me make a quick response to John 17, because this will be the annihilation of his objections. John 17, verses 1 to 2. Christians, lend me your ears. This is, this is your theology. This is the word of your God speaking to us, so let's understand it in context. John 17, verse 1 to 2. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, 
Number one, he's praying to the Father. All of the Quran is not the Father of Jesus. He's not the Father of anyone. So right there, you got a problem with that. The only true God that Jesus is referring to is the Father of Jesus. Muhammad's God is not the Father of Jesus. Father, the hour has come. Here's where you really need to pay attention. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Notice it's reciprocal. Jesus saying, and by the way, if you read the Greek, doxaxen me, it's imperative. It's a command, but it's not a disrespectful command. It's a son who knows his value and worth, and he knows that he's one with the Father who can make such demands of the Almighty God. Father, glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. Number one, and I challenge Adnan and all the Muslims, quote a single verse from the Bible, quote a verse in the Quran where a righteous servant of God, not some evil, demonized opposer, not Satan, where a righteous servant of God would say to God, O oh Allah, glorify me so that I may glorify you. In other words, Jesus is saying it's reciprocal. The Father glorifies me the way I glorify him, right? I glorify the Father in the way he glorifies me. Something a creature cannot say would be blasphemous. But then it goes on to say in verse 2, since you have given him, who? Your son, the son that you glorify in the same way that the son glorifies you. You've given him, me, third person, speaking of himself in the third person. You've given him power over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom he has, to all whom, sorry, to all whom you have given him. Two points in verse 2. Jesus says he is the son that has power over all flesh. Folks, last time I checked, Muhammad was flesh. Muslims are flesh. Jesus claims that he's the son of God who owns all flesh who is sovereign over all human beings, and all human beings are subject to him, belong to him, including Muhammad. So according to this verse, Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus. He's Jesus' property, and Jesus owns him. But then it gets you a little better. You have appointed the Son to give everlasting life. What kind of life? Never-ending, physically indestructible, morally incorruptible life to all believers. David, help me understand. In order for Jesus to be able to take all believers, no matter how numerous, and make them immortal, physically indestructible, morally incorruptible, so they never sin again and bring upon God's wrath, doesn't that mean that Jesus has to be all-powerful to do it? And secondly, doesn't Jesus have to know who all the believers are and therefore must be omniscient? Uh, it's, it's, he, he's definitely not sounding like a mere uh, Muslim prophet, dude. And that's the context of verse 3. Uh -huh. And this is the eternal life that you, they may know you, the only true God of Jesus Christ whom you sent. So Jesus is saying, I am the Son who's one with the only true God, my Father, whom the Father glorifies in the same way that the Son glorifies Him, who can do all that the Father does. And the things that the Father does, only the true God can do. So if Jesus can do all that the Father does, give everlasting life to all believers, and that's something only the true God can do, Jesus is not saying the Father is the only true God to the exclusion of the Son. He's the only true God in union with the Son, the Son that shared the same glory with him before the world was created and will now share that glory again in his presence. There you go. Yeah, here's, uh, here, here's what's funny, Sam. Um, as, you, as you pointed out, um, notice these verses that Adnan's going to. The Father is greater than I. I'll ignore everything around it, but I'll stick with the Father is greater than I. The Father, the only true God, I'll, I'll, I'll take that and ignore everything around it. He keeps doing this, but his book, his book affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of our book. But notice, if our book consisted solely and exclusively of the, of the, of the passages he's quoting and everything else was wrong, and he says, these are the unequivocal verses that I agree with, Islam is still false. Islam is still false if we go with these verses. The, yeah. His favorite verses, the one that he's quoting, if we only go with these verses, Islam is still false because Allah, Allah, is, not a, Allah is a father to no one. Yeah, 100%. And, so, and Jesus is the son that the father glorifies in the same way that the son... What Muslim, I want a Muslim say, Oh Allah, glorify me that I may glorify you. All right. Well, so we notice those... Gosh, guys, those are the, those are the verses that Adnan says are unequivocal. You take all these passages where Jesus is claiming, Jesus is making claims that make no sense if he's merely a human being. 
or if he's merely a human prophet. These verses make no sense. Even the passages that Anan is quoting make no sense whatsoever if you actually read the passages and you try to think, is this a, is this a Muslim prophet? They make no sense. You can't understand these passages without an understanding of Jesus' dual nature, right? But Anan knows his listeners and he knows his, his, uh, his fans do not study any of this, do not care about any of this. They're only interested in confirming the Quran when, guys, this is our point, their book affirms our book, and our book is the one saying these things about Jesus. So, all right, shall we? Shall we continue? All right, Go we ahead. gotta try it. We gotta try it. We gotta try it. Oh man, we're on clip eleven now. Let's see what we now get. coming to the question David asked. Finally. So why is he asking for this statement? Because he knows the New Testament is corrupt. Hold up! Hold up! Hold up! What Notice <laughs> all of he that stuff it. that we just watch, and now he says. Finally, we come to the question. <laughs> it was a simple question, right? Give us a verse. Give us the verse. You Muslims believe that there are verses in the Quran wow. that say that our, our scripture has been corrupted. He goes through all this time, and now he gets to, oh, and here's the verse. All right, let's go ahead and watch. Asked. So why is he asking for this statement? Because he knows the New Testament is corrupt, and the Quran does teach that the New Testament is corrupt. I'll give you one short example very quickly. I don't want to go on for too long. The Quran in chapter 4, verse 157, categorically states that Jesus was definitely definitely not killed. He was not crucified. He was not killed. Gospels state that he was crucified and he was killed. In other words, the Quran is indirectly saying that the Gospels are corrupt. This statement is not unequivocal. It is not saying the New Testament is corrupt, but the outcome whoa, is... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you catch that? He gave, he's given one verse so far, and this is all he's given, ever, to show that the Quran is affirming the corruption of our text. But look, look at what he said. He just said, and by the way, this is not unequivocal. Watch this. <laughs> this statement is not unequivocal. It what? Is not <laughs> it's not unequivocal. <laughs> uh, Boy, notice I lay down the challenge. Guys, give me one unequivocal verse in the Quran saying that the, saying that, uh, the gospel has been corrupted. Every Muslim... I mean, you're talking hundreds of Muslims have sent me this clip saying, has sent me this video saying, aha, he refuted you and he showed you and answered you. And what does he say? David, you're right. Even this one, even the only one I'm quoting doesn't show that isn't unequivocal. All right, but let's, yeah. let's go ahead and read it. In that other part. words, the Check Quran is indirectly <clears throat> saying that the Gospels are corrupt. This statement is not unequivocal. It is not saying the New Testament is corrupt, but the outcome is that, that the New Testament is corrupt. And the Quran in this particular verse, chapter 4, verse 157, clearly states that they follow nothing but conjecture. Those who differ among themselves, those who, those who differ about the matter of crucifixion among themselves, who are those who differ among themselves is the question. The gospel authors, the gospel authors, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters out there, and I'm talking to Christians here, the gospel authors, None of them agree fully, none of them, not one of them fully agree as to the details of the matter of crucifixion. Ooh. I don't know mm -hmm. if I should give Adnan the benefit of the doubt, but I think I caught Adnan a little lie there. Mm. He says this verse is directed towards Christians, those who are, um, uh, yep. those who only follow conjecture and are full of doubt. Sam, is, is it wrong or is, is, is Allah responding to Jews here? You just read the verses immediately proceeding. It's talking about the Jews insulting Mary, the mother of Christ. And it says, and, and the verse begins, it's saying, and for they, they're boasting, we mm -hmm. kill Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Mary, the apostle of Allah. Uh -huh. Which Christian is going to say, hey, we killed the Messiah. Je yeah. These for, for, are Jews. For, for that matter, which Jew is going to say, we killed exactly. the Messiah. <laughs> We killed the Messiah, right? ladies and gentlemen. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it's ironic. Hmm. Two things to highlight. Number one. Last time I checked, folks, again, this is the best that Islam has to offer. This is their best, uh, honestly. So he's arguing similarly to the way Shabir Ali would argue. He makes similar points that the Quran doesn't. Shabir Ali admits he, the Quran doesn't come out black and white and say the Bible's corrupt, but it says things to imply the corruption of the Bible because it contradicts its core doctrines. That's even a Shabir Ali can art. But coming back to this issue, you go and watch Adnan Rashid's debate with Samuel Green and others, especially James White, on the crucifixion. Here's... Adnan wants to have his cake and eat it too. <clears throat> he wants to prove that this passage is implicitly saying the New Testament's corrupt because it denies the crucifixion. But then he debates Christians on the basis of the New Testament to show the New Testament says Jesus didn't die. 
via crucifixion. So I'm a little baffled. Remember, I'm not a logician, David Wood. I'm, I'm not. You're the logician. How can you say that the Quran is implicitly testifying to the New Testament being corrupted and then debate Christians on the basis of the New Testament to show that the New Testament denies that Jesus died by cr crucifixion, but he was rescued per Psalm 91? Mm -hmm. I'm confused. Yep. Can you help me understand that? I'm confused in all kinds of ways uh, because <laughs> notice, I mean, look, what he's saying here in effect is the Quran contradicts the Bible. Therefore, the Quran must be saying that the, the Bible has been corrupted. When our entire point is the author exactly. of the Quran has no clue what he's talking about. He doesn't know what's in the Bible. He affirms the Bible. He tells us to judge by the Bible. He tells us that we have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand upon the Bible. That's what he tells us over and over again. He says no one can change his words. Adnan doesn't refute any of that, not one word of it. We ask him for, can you can you show us one verse that talks about the corruption of our text in your book that's filled with nothing but affirmation of our text? And he says, well, it must be, it, the Quran must be saying it's corrupt because uh, this contradicts <laughs> this contradicts our book. Great, you've just given us the other arm of the Islamic dilemma, right? We need, two, we need two points to affirm the Islamic dilemma. One, the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, authority of the gospel. And two... The Quran contradicts the gospel, right? Uh, we say, hey, look, the Quran, we, 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 we tell Muslims, hey, your Quran affirms our book. And then they change the subject to, oh, but the Quran uh, contradicts the Bible. We know that. We know that. We, we're, we're, we are defending that. So you're simply agreeing with us over and over and over again. We make these claims. They don't refute the claims. And then they agree with other things we're saying that destroy their religion. This is amazing stuff, man. Yeah. And the second point I want to add, guys, understand what he said. We follow nothing but conjecture regarding Jesus' crucifixion. Now, this now ends up proving the Quran is corrupted and that the Quran has been dismembered, as chapter 15, verses 90, 91 states. Christians, follow the logic. We follow nothing but conjecture when it comes to Jesus being killed by crucifixion. But last time I checked, there is no unanimity in the Muslim sources regarding what chapter 4, verse 157 means precisely? Now, let me qualify what, what I'm saying there. You will find that the earliest tradition, one that is attributed to Ibn Abbas, that it was one of Jesus' disciples that was made to look like Jesus, and he died on the cross. But then others disagreed, saying, no, it was probably Tatawis, or it was probably Judas. And then now you have Muslims like Shabir Ali saying, no, the Quran doesn't say that someone was made to look like Jesus and they killed that lookalike in the place of Jesus. In reality, what it's saying is Jesus wasn't killed by the cross, though he was on the cross and he swooned, the apparent death the theory, that he swooned on the cross. So they thought he died. That's how Allah made it appear to them. They, they thought he died, but he actually passed out, he swooned, and then Allah miraculously resuscitated him while he was in the tomb after being beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, doesn't die, but swoons, and then somehow comes out of the grave, fully conscious, because that's the miracle of Allah. So who's following conjecture? The Muslims. Why? Because they can't make heads or tails out of what this passage is saying exactly. And this is the passage that Adnan wants to use to try to prove our New Testament's corrupt, if anything, it now backfires at not. It proves your Quran is corrupt because till this day, you guys can't figure out the precise meaning of a passage that says that they neither killed him nor crucified him, but it so appeared unto them. And you can't even agree. What does that mean? It so appeared unto them. And surprise, surprise, if you want to take the view that Allah made it look like Jesus died, then how can the New Testament be corrupted? when they're simply going along with the scheme of your God and saying Jesus did die because Allah made it appear to them as he did die. So why, why would you blame them for writing that down as part of the gospel that Allah sent down when Allah made it appear to them that he died and convinced them of that? Help me out, David. Yeah, ju just, just imagine this, right? Uh, Allah, according to the Quran, makes this uh, great big illusion. He makes everyone think that they're seeing Jesus crucified on the cross. And they all see it. They see it with their own eyes. It's a public event. Uh, the Romans knew about it. The Jews knew about it. The Christians knew about it. Everyone knows because it, they see it. And 2,000 years worth of people affirm that Jesus died by crucifixion. His followers went out declaring that he died on the cross. And 
Adnan says, you see, the Quran points out that they follow nothing but conjecture. Ha ha. W what do you mean? They saw it with their own eyes. If Anan is right, then everything we see with our own eyes is nothing but conjecture. It's just, ah, we're, eh, we have no, we have no basis for what we're saying other than the fact that we saw it with our own eyes. Do you imagine, I mean, what, gosh, what kind of God condemns what you see with your own eyes? Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, so, so, and so notice this, um, this is Allah. So notice, ladies and gentlemen, first, first be aware of this, especially you Muslims. Because when we say, where does the Quran affirm that the gospel has been corrupted? We get responses from Muslims. Oh, you know, chapter 2, verse 79. Oh, chapter 2, verse 75. Oh, chapter 3. We, they give us verses. Why did Mufassil Islam, the Muslim apologist and YouTuber, not use those? Why did he not just quote those? This is Adnan Rashid in an 18 or 20 minute video or whatever it is. He's not using any of those verses that you guys think are about the corruption of the of the gospel, of the Christian scriptures. Why are these guys not using them? Because these guys know those verses don't mean that. They know that we are familiar with their commentaries and with the with the with the with the literary context and with other things the Quran say. They know that if they quote those, we will obliterate them. That's why they're not using them. That is why they're not using them. Th guys, that should make you th that should make you think. You Muslims who are watching, that should make you stop and think, wait a minute. All these verses that I think are about the corruption of the gospel. My my apologists won't won't dare won't dare quoting those against against Sam Shumuf. They won't dare. Maybe there's a reason, and maybe the reason is because there's no way they could defend it against Sam Shumuf, and they don't want to bring it up and give Sam Shumuf the opportunity to massacre what uh, the argument. They don't want to do that. Because yeah. they'd rather have you, they'd rather have you Muslims in the chat go around thinking that Surah two, Surah two verse seventy nine refutes uh, refutes the what the, everything else the Quran says about about the perfect preservation of our scriptures. They want you to think that, so they don't want to bring it up because they don't want us responding to it, right? Okay. And so, where does Adnan go? He goes to Surah four verse one fifty seven, knowing that even Muslims can't agree on what happened, knowing that Muslims have had all kinds of positions, and even in the earliest commentaries, they contradict each other all, all over the place on what this verse means. And then he says, you see, dumb Christians, they have nothing but, they have <laughs> nothing but conje conjecture to follow. <laughs> Allah, who's responding to Jews who boast, but by the way, you Jews who are watching, you know you've never said, you know you never say this, you know you never said, aha, yes, we killed Christ the Messiah, we killed him, right? Yep. You know you've never said that, but that's what Allah is accusing you of doing. But Allah responds to your imaginary boasts that you killed the Messiah by saying, you're wrong, you didn't kill him, you didn't crucify him, and you're following nothing but conjecture. Adnan takes that verse, which he knows is directed towards, towards these supposed Jews who are boasting, and he says, what's Allah talking about here? He's talking about Christians and their scriptures. He's saying that their scriptures are contradictory, and he's condemning their scriptures even though... <laughs> even though this has nothing yeah. to do with it. This is the best, Sam. This is the best. He had, he had, I, I put, I put out my challenge on Tuesday. He had all the time in the world to formulate his perfect response. He spends 12 minutes of his video going over nothing that has anything to do with anything, <clears throat> just pretending, pretending that belief in the books is not one of the, not one of the, uh, the articles of faith without which you cannot be a Muslim, pretending that it's just inconsequential and irrelevant. And then when he finally gets to actually answering the question, he admits that I'm right. That's right. This is not unequivocal. And then he pretends that this verse is a response to Christians that is that is saying that our scriptures have been corrupted. So ladies and gentlemen, on the one hand, we have Allah clearly, indisputably claiming that Christians have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. But we're supposed to throw out all of those clear verses and go with a passage where Allah is responding to Jews and he says, ha ha, you think you crucified him? Well, you didn't. And we're supposed to take that as Allah giving secret coded language that yeah. is telling us that our scriptures have been corrupted, which completely contradicts everything he said about our scriptures. And this is the best that Islam has to offer on this issue. Oh, but David, that was the surprise. Surprise, <laughs> surprise. David. Surprise. Yeah, that was it. That was a surprise. See, that was a surprise, man. Can't you get it? They were trying to surprise you. Come on.
Um, guys, there are actually there are actually a few more clips here, but this was Adnan's argument. He has a couple more clips where he 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 argues that according to Bruce Metzger, the the New Testament's been corrupted. So he goes yeah. to argue. He goes on to basically say, um, but we don't need the Quran to know that the Bible's been corrupted because we have this other stuff. Uh, should we actually go through these last few clips, me, or well, or should we? Here, what what we should we can do is sum it up this way, and you can play them. But here's the summary. Let's assume, David. Guys, yeah. understand. He's appealing to Bruce Metzger, Bart Ehrman. Let's assume, and by the way, Bruce Metzger didn't believe that the New Testament was corrupted where you couldn't know what the original said, but put yep. that aside. Let's assume, guys, notice how, again, he destroys Islam, destroys the Quran, and destroys Muhammad. Let's assume, Adnan, I hope he listens to this. Bruce Metzger, Bart Ehrman are right. The New Testament has been corrupted beyond restoration, and therefore we don't know what it originally said. Don't you get it, guy, that the whole point of David's video and the whole point of Islamic dilemma, Muhammad said the scriptures of the Jews and Christians are incorruptible, preserved by Allah. They cannot be corrupted. They haven't been corrupted. They existed in the possession of the Jews and Christians at the time of Muhammad. This is some, simply a fact of history. The textual data, the historical archaeological data demonstrates beyond any reasonable doubt that what the Jews and Christians were reading at the time of Muhammad are the books of the Bible we read today. So Muhammad said, you Jews, you Christians, your scriptures, uncorrupt, preserve the word of God, and I confirm them as proof of my prophethood. But those are the scriptures that expose them as a fraud. So if Adnan ends up proving that Bruce Metzger and Bart Ehrman are right, even though Bruce Metzger didn't believe that, but put that aside, the Bible has been corrupted, he just proved that Muhammad didn't know what he's talking about because Muhammad affirmed scriptures that the historical evidence and textual scholars say have been corrupted. Thank you, Adnan, for bringing in Bruce Metzger and Bart Ehrman to show Muhammad didn't know what he was talking about. He was wrong about the Bible because you believe they're right about the Bible. Therefore, he's a false prophet. Why are you still a Muslim? See, that's the point. All right. Well, uh, Sam, uh, we asked we asked the people in there, and they said yes. They want us to play the other clips. Okay, so this is what? this is I think this I think this is going to be the longest uh, live stream in the history of uh, anything I've ever done. But we'll go and play these last few clips. And notice after this point, they don't have a lot of anything to do with anything. And as Sam pointed out, if we take these if we take Anand's arguments here seriously, all they mean is that. Islam is false and that Allah was wrong and Allah didn't know any of this. Muhammad didn't know any of this and therefore Islam is false. But we'll go ahead and check out these last few clips. Remember, Anand's only argument was Surah 4 verse 157 claims that it contradicted, it contradicts the Bible. I mean, it contradicts the Quran. Surah, I mean, Surah 4 verse 157 contradicts the Bible and therefore is somehow indirectly affirming the corruption of the Bible, even though Allah does nothing but affirm the Bible. Now notice, even if we just went with that, he just proved the Islamic dilemma. His God affirms the inspiration, preservation, authority of our scriptures and then contradicts our scriptures and therefore Islam is false. But let's continue. Now he's going to go on to a bunch of other topics, attacking the Bible, attacking, uh, yeah, attacking the New Testament and so on. But let's see what he's got. Oh, first now, the resurrection. Follow is some information for you to look at as to how gospel records they disagree on matters of details uh, when it comes to crucifixion so why did god inspire different information to these different authors writing gospels why is god playing these games if god is one and this one god has inspired the four authors of the Gospels, why is he inspiring different information to these four authors for one particular matter, on one particular matter, the matter of crucifixion. So the slides you are looking at, right now the information, the verses you are looking at, the diversity in the Gospel records, why is God inspiring different information to four authors to give the same message? This is the question you have to answer. So these are the people who are in conjecture, they are in doubt about the matter of crucifixion or they are in difference they are in conflict with each other on matters of crucifixion or, or, or the details of the crucifixion um so there you have it uh, there you have it sam um yep. our scriptures are our scriptures which are affirmed as the inspired preserved authoritative word of allah contradict each other 
in addition to contradicting the Quran. So the scriptures that Allah affirms as the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God have internal contradictions, but also contradict the Quran. And this yeah. is supposed to make Muslims feel better <clears throat> about their religion. And yeah. it's supposed to be a response to my challenge. Show me one unequivocal verse where the Quran affirms the corruption of yeah. the gospel. What do you think? Yeah, now let's make sure the Christians get what he just did. Folks understand how he's proving David Wood's point over and over again, and I'm actually getting tired because either you are so ignorant and you're not getting the point or you're scheming in imitation of your prophet and his deity because Allah is the greatest of all schemers. If Muhammad says the scriptures of the Christians at his time were the incorruptible revelations of God, and the only scriptures those Christians had were the books of the New Testament. And the only Gospels they read were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if he's now proven, which he hasn't, because Christians have harmonized these alleged contradictions, just like we can have a field day with all the contradictions of the Quran and see him go through hoops and trying to harmonize the errors of the Quran. But let's agree with him. David, let's agree. The Gospels are notoriously contradictory. Adnan, do you not realize you just proved Muhammad is a false prophet? Because your prophet said to the Christians in his Quran, the Quran, you Christians, your scriptures, the uncorrupt revelations of God. What you have, that is the gospel of Jesus, passed on to Jesus, to his followers, preserved by Allah, and judged by them. Chapter 5, verse 47, judged by your gospel. Adnan just got done proving, for argument's sake, proving those gospels full of contradictions, they can't be the word of God. Which means Adnan knows more than Muhammad. Muhammad either <clears throat> lied when he said that Allah revealed to him that their scriptures are incorruptible because Allah, if he's truly God, could make such an absurd claim because Allah would surely know they're full of contradictions. Or Adnan, again, is skirting the issue that if he's a Muslim, he cannot go against the view of his prophet. His prophet said to Adnan, here's my view of the Bible. What they have, the uncorrupt revelations of God. And what they had at the time, Muhammad, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So you cannot attack the Gospels without going against Muhammad. So if you go against Muhammad, the gig is up. You're no longer a Muslim. But thank you for helping us prove that Muhammad is a false prophet. Yeah, so do you guys uh, understand? And apparently Adnan's followers and fans just do not recognize this, right? So we point out, remember, I, po I posted this in my video. I said... Uh, I, I raise this challenge. Give me one, un, just one, just one unequivocal verse in the Quran, which says the gospel has been corrupted. I named a bunch of passages. I named a bunch of passages where the Quran affirms the gospel, the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the gospel. I gave a bunch of passages that do that. Anand says he's leaving that out because, you know, it's just a bunch of uh, irrelevant stuff. He ignores all of those. And then he says, and then he says that Surah 4 verse 157 somehow implies the corruption of our scriptures, even though Allah does nothing but affirm our scriptures. The verse somehow implies the exact opposite of what Allah says throughout the Quran. And then he goes on to attack the Bible and say, aha, but the Bible's full of contradictions, which as Sam pointed out, we can do it with the Quran. We can do it with the Quran. We'd be happy, we'd be happy to run, run through some. That's not the point. The point was, suppose we just grant everything he just said. So he just put all those passages up on the screen. Suppose we just say, yep, we agree with you. Tons of contradictions. We won't try to reconcile them. We won't try to examine what's being said. We'll just accept all these contradictions. What did he just do? What did he just do? He's he's destroyed. He's destroyed the testimony of his God and his prophet. His God and his prophet say, we have the gospel. We have it. It's our book. We have it. We're the people of the book. Our book is the gospel. We have it. And I don't, ha ha, they don't even understand their book has been corrupted. We know, uh -huh. we know that it contains all these internal contradictions. And his Muslim fans go, yeah, what a brilliant point. We don't understand how he just destroyed Allah and he just destroyed Muhammad and how he's destroying our entire religion and undermining everything Allah says about why we have to believe in these books. He just destroyed one whole article of faith and we don't see it. This, 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 this is... Oh, boy. Gosh, That's this is some spiritual, serious spiritual Spiritual, blindness. spiritual warfare. But in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may he set them free in Jesus' name. So go ahead. All right, let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and get through... Uh, there's, only, there's only a couple more now, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, get through these real quick, like... 
So having said that, finally, the last point I want to make is, do we need the Quran to believe that the New Testament has been changed, altered or corrupted? Do we need the Quran for that? Absolutely not. No. We need the Christians to tell us that. And the Christians have told us that. This is a book in front of you, titled, The Text of the New Testament, Its Transmission, Corruption and Restoration, 4th edition by Bruce Metzger. Bruce Metzger is the author of this particular book. Bruce Metzger, by the way, died a Christian, having believed that the text of the New Testament was transmitted, it was corrupted, and then it was allegedly restored. And who restores it? Who restored the text of the New Testament after it was completely corrupted beyond repair? This is another work by Bruce Metzger titled A, text, a Textual Commentary on the Greek New Testament, 2nd edition, Bruce Metzger. Um, Sam, I only have uh, one commentary, and I think that I think the, the the remainder of his clips are along these lines. I only have one 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 yeah. one comment, um, yeah. and and it's it's since we're on the since we we've been talking about logic, there yeah. is the fallacy of equivocation where you change the meaning of a word. Hundred percent being used, right? Yeah, hundred percent. When textual critics use the word corruption, they mean, hey, here's. Uh, here's a verse, and this other verse has a different word or phrase or something like that in it, and we do not know which one goes back to the original. We are not sure which one goes back to the original. They do that with corruptions that have nothing to do with what Muslims mean by yeah. corruption, right? Yeah. What yeah. Muslims mean by corruption is corruption of doctrine. You, There has to be somewhere some some uh, some gospel that doesn't affirm that Jesus is the divine son of God, that doesn't affirm that Jesus died on the cross for sins, that doesn't affirm that Jesus rose from the dead, right? They, it's Notice, Anan, when he starts off, ah, this is all about core doctrine, core doctrine. Sam, which manuscript of the Bible anywhere undermines core Christian doctrine? No single manuscript overthrows the historic Christian faith. And you know what's ironic? And I want the Christians to listen to this mm -hmm. because I want them to understand Bart Ehrman is his greatest enemy. Why? <clears throat> Folks, don't take my word for it. Even though Bart Ehrman has sensationalized the very readings of the Bible, making them more than what it is for shock value, Bart Ehrman himself is proof that the Bible has been preserved. And you know why? And David knows this. But for the Christians here, here's how I know that Bart Ehrman believes that what the authors originally wrote has been preserved. He would not be able to write books on what Jesus taught. He would not be able to write books on what Paul believed. He would not be able to write books on Jesus' view of heaven and hell. Read some of the titles of his book, How Jesus Became God. Or right now he came up with a book on heaven and hell, what the Bible actually teaches. He could not write these books if he didn't take for granted and assume that what the authors originally wrote have been handed on and preserved after all. If he tells me that Paul taught this about Jesus, uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. Ehrman, but if the New Testament has been corrupted beyond restoration or beyond your ability to know what they originally wrote, how do you know that Paul wrote that? So the very books he writes and the lectures he gives on what Paul taught, what Peter believed, betray the fact that he must assume that the original wording of what the authors originally wrote is there in the manuscript tradition, and with careful analysis, <clears throat> scholars are able to recover or identify what they said. Otherwise, mm -hmm. he can't write books on Paul's theology or Jesus's eschatological views. So Bart Ehrman is an argument for the veracity of the Bible, not an argument against it, but Adnan doesn't want to see it yeah that's so, that's so, what i would say so again i mean you uh and matter of fact give me a, i'll post a comment uh, by doomslayer here doomslayer said a lot of muslims use uh, a lot of muslims use bart ehrman a lot that is correct and the entire argument is based on equivocation right the entire yes. thing is based on equivocation again scholars if they are not sure about what the original reading was and guys to when we talk about that when a muslim hears corruption they're thinking aha it's just like changed everything no, 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 no. We're talking about things like I mean, one of the most common spelling differences, right? The word, yes. the, 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 the name John can be spelled in Greek with one new or two news, right? That's one N or two yeah. N's. 
Well, That's guess what? Common, when, yeah. Guess what? When it, when people were copying it, some people spelled it with two n's and some people spelled it with one n. If you are if you cannot say with certainty which which one the original had, which whether it was spelled with one or two, they called that a corruption, right? That we can't yes. get that. And so we have to use probabilistic arguments to determine and, and look at the manuscript tradition, try to figure out whether the original was spelled with one N or two Ns. Well, you have all sorts of things like that. They do not affect any Christian doctrine. They don't affect anything Christians believe, but they're saying corruption. They're saying textual variance. They're saying you've got all these textual variants. And Muslims hear the word corruption. Aha, this is affirming that there are all these different gospels and they say all these different things. No, no. No one says yeah. that. No actual scholar, not Bart Ehrman, no one. Bart Ehrman says that Jesus' death by crucifixion is one of the best established facts of history. He yes. says that the New Testament is the best preserved work of antiquity. Completely, yes. you know, completely contradicting what Muslims think, that, What completely contradicting the exact opposite of what Muslims think he means. And just to confirm what you're saying, David, Bart Ehrman himself has stated that no core doctrines of the Christian faith are affected by any of the variant readings. And he says, the majority of the variants are insignificant, inconsequential. He admits this. Yep. So so Isn't that's it? that's one point. Two, th didn't didn't Ehrman say uh, in, in an appendix or uh, a Q&A? That's the one that, I'm referring to. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, didn't he didn't he say that Muslims, if Muslims would actually pay attention to the history of their book, they'd see that the same thing applies to applies to their book. Hundred percent, he believes that about any and every book written in antiquity, medieval period, prior to the printing press, because it's simply. And by the way, you guys did a talk on this, you and Hatun, mm -hmm. on the corruption of the Quran and the various Qurans and the thousands of variant readings in the Arabic Quran. So mm -hmm. if we're going to play that game, he just destroyed the Quran. But coming back to the issue. Bart Ehrman realizes, as everyone else realizes, that prior to the printing press, everything that's hand copied, it is simply human nature that you're going to have variant readings because no two copyists copy the same way or make the same mistakes. And there is no copyist that when he's writing a very huge, let's say, book in those conditions, they didn't have lighting, they didn't have typewriters, they didn't have computers. It's going to be a miracle if that copyist doesn't introduce some error of some kind, but it's inconsequential because you can see from the context what the error is and what the true reading is. And because of the mass of manuscript evidence, even though Bart Ehrman likes to downplay this, it is simply a fact. Once a reading gets into the manuscript tradition, it stays there. That's why you have someone like Robert Bowman Jr., an outstanding, renowned, Trinitarian evangelical scholar who says that the manuscript tradition of the New Testament can be compared to a jigsaw puzzle where the box comes with 10,100 pieces, even though you only need 10,000 pieces. Now, again, that may not be the exact number he gave, but this is what we have with the New Testament manuscript tradition. We have nothing lost. We have just <clears throat> excess. So if you have a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle, what we have is 10,100 pieces. Nothing lost, but we have to identify what the additional pieces are. And that's why when you read any translation done by committees, you'll see that the English translations agree over 90% of the time because you can understand what the original says over 90% of the time. And the differences are still there. Nothing is lost. This is simply a fact of the manuscript tradition. Mm -hmm. It's a fact. And even, uh, e e even for the remaining times, they're usually inconsequential. And again, yes. nothing ever undermines a core Christian doctrine. So when people yeah. like Adnan, aha, they talk about the, the, the corruption of the text. Those guys would say the exact same thing about the Quran, especially if you had the much worse situation that you have in the Quran, where instead of actually preserving the manuscripts and comparing them, they just they burn them all, yeah. right? You know, Uthman, you know had, Uthman, had, Uthman had to burn all of the manuscripts to cover up all of the differences. Go ahead. And, and you know what Ehrman would say about that? The very fact that there was a purging by Uthman says, you will never know what the Quran originally said as it came from the mouth of Muhammad because there was a purging and all you have is Uthman's editorial patchwork of what he believed was the true Quran. Mm -hmm. So Ehrman would be with us in saying, hey, Muslims, you got a problem. You cannot know with absolute certainty what the original Quran in every place said that came from the mouth of Muhammad. All you can do at best 
is come to Uthman's recension revision, and even then it's questionable because the extent manuscript tradition shows that the Uthmanic version of the Quran has thousands of variants in the Arabic, not the English translations. Mm -hmm. Um, so, matter of fact, we'll just go ahead and play these last few clips. They're all along these lines. But notice, guys, even if we granted, even if we granted everything Adnan said, and we allowed him to completely misrepresent and distort what Metzger meant, right? So suppose we don't know what Metzger actually meant by, by corruption. We don't know what scholars actually mean. And we think that it's what Adnan suggests. That there are just all these different Bibles and they're saying all these different things. And, you know, who knows what Christian doctrine is? Let's assume that. What has he done? He's destroyed Allah and Muhammad. 100%. Because Allah and Muhammad affirm the scriptures we have, the scriptures that Adnan is talking about. And David, note what the title of the book was. It's Restoration. How could the title say Restoration New Testament if Bruce Metzger believed you could not restore the original wording yeah. of the original uh, auto, you know, autographs? Yeah, so notice, no. notice, guys, all the stuff that, 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 that Sam was pointing out, right? If you have a bunch of people copying texts, if you have a bunch of people copying texts, and then they're translating the text, and now you have people copying uh, texts in, in different languages, well, notice you have all the copies in the original language, you have the, the copies in the other languages, but you know what year those other those alternative uh, other language versions started, and you end up, and you have people quoting them, you have people from the 2nd century, and 3rd century, and 4th century, church fathers quoting these passages and stuff. So you have all of this evidence. Well, when someone makes a mistake or changes something or something like that, guess what? Now you have what's called a corruption. You're, that text has been corrupted. Uh, that, that, that future manuscripts that are copied from that are now corrupted, right? So you say, aha, the Bible's been corrupted. Well, that's what textual critics do. They say, let's line up all the manuscripts and then we can actually see where, where these things occurred and we can get back, right? So Metzger saying we can do that and even if we even if we grant all of, even if we say all of that's a problem or something like that, that one the same would be true of the Quran, except much worse because they're actually getting together and conspiring to burn all the evidence. But two, you can grant all that, and if you say it's a problem, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's perfectly normal for human beings to make make mistakes and so on as they're as they're making copies of giant books. It makes sense how we can how we can get back to the original readings. If you if you want to just take an extreme view and say, oh, but we just can't know anything, then great, you just destroyed Allah and Muhammad. Allah said no one can change his words, and none saying, nope, look, all the words are changed. Allah says no one can change my words, and Muslims are saying, nope, they've been changed. All right? Um, oh boy. <laughs> one quick one quick comment here. Muhammad Laban was responding to too many Marys, and he says the Quran says the Bible of the time of the Quran is true. In which verse? How about in? A bunch of verses right and not not just not just uh, verses of the Quran but also passages uh, hadiths from Muhammad but just yep. uh, we, we've been through this like a million times we'll give you a couple uh, Muhammad in Surah 7 verse 157 a lot this is talking about people during the time of Muhammad finding Muhammad mentioned in the Torah and the gospel it says we have the Torah and the gospel um, Surah 5 verse 43 of the Quran some Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute and Allah says why are they coming to you when they have the Torah so what is that? That's Jews coming to Muhammad. That means during Muhammad's time. If it's during Muhammad's time, then what copy of the Torah do they have? That would be the Torah that they have. That would mean the Quran is affirming the Torah of their time. A few verses later, Surah 5, verse 47, commands Christians to judge by the gospel. If Allah is commanding the Christians of Muhammad's time, because he's told to say this, He's, you have to say this to Christians. They're supposed to say to Christians, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. They're supposed to say that. Well, if that if I'm telling you as a Christian to judge by the gospel, I'm assuming you have the gospel. It wouldn't make any sense if you didn't have the gospel. It wouldn't make it wouldn't make any sense to say, hey, judge by slub glob. You say, what? What's slub glob? I don't know. Something. Nothing. <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense. It only makes sense if you actually are affirming the book that they have. Uh, when the Quran says that Jews and Christians have no ground to stand upon, it's chapter 5, verse 68, no ground to stand upon unless they stand upon the Torah and the gospel. Makes no sense unless we have the Torah and the gospel. So if you don't see how this is affirming, you've let your view of what the Quran says be influenced by your beliefs as a Muslim, and you've thrown your own God under the bus, and you don't care what yeah. he says. So Yeah, but surprise, David. That was a surprise. All right, we have to get through these last clips, man. We have to yeah, get through. Sure. I think it's I, I think it's all the same, and not just attacking the Bible and still not answering the simple question that I asked. But let's go. 
on page 11 of the introduction actually page 10 of the introduction it states of the approximately 5,000 Greek manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament that are known today no two agree exactly in all particulars confronted by a mass of conflicting conflicting now now, now notice Sam uh, he said exactly what you already said if you have if you have different people copying the entire Bible they're not going to make the same mistakes and therefore they're not going to agree on everything but that you can spot when one person makes a mistake because other people do not make that same mistake you already pointed that out and then he's quoting this he's quoting this as the refutation to prove that the, you know the Bible's just so messed up you you, you can't know what you're talking about all right yeah. let's go ahead and finish this editors oh must decide which variants deserve to be included in the text and which should be relegated to the apparatus. In other words, Bruce Metzger is saying that the editors today in the 21st century decide as to what may go to the text of the New Testament. Men in the 21st century decide choosing from thousands of variant readings of the New Testament as to what may be included in the text. Although, and I continue, Although at first it may seem to be a hopeless task amid so many thousands of variant readings to sort out those that should be regarded as original, textual scholars have developed certain generally acknowledged criteria of evaluation. These considerations depend, it will be seen, upon probabilities and sometimes the textual critic must weigh one set of probabilities against another. All right, ladies and gentlemen, th think about this. Uh, think something about something think about I have to regard him as being deceptive here there's there's no other way yeah. Sam if, if, if he's if he's read anything these guys have said he knows what they mean he yeah. represents it to Muslims like this um, can you imagine people in the 21st century deciding what the original said and what's supposed to be in there oh my goodness how is this even possible guys let us run let us run you through the process again right people for century after century after century after century until the inventing of the printing press, are copying these things by hand, right? You're copying things by hand, you end up making mistakes. Uh, you can occasionally have someone who says, eh, I think it could be written better this way. You do have that happen, right? You can spot those things, right? If you have thousands of manuscripts, you can spot, oh, here's where, here's where someone changed something. You can spot it, right? So you have people in the 21st century, because keep in mind, if you're talking about a thousand years ago, people would have known about the manuscripts that they have right there with them. They don't know about manuscripts that are still, uh, you know, inside the wall of a church yes. or something like that. Right now, scholars in the 21st century have a mass, have a giant, giant mass of manuscripts. And they can date these manuscripts to know when they come from. And they can sit back and say, here are the rules of how textual criticism works. And they can go through the manuscripts and say, aha, we know that this, this change right here was introduced in the 11th century. Doesn't look like that's original. So let's go over here, right? They can do this. And Adnan acts like these guys are just, haha, we're just picking and choosing, blah, 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 blah. No, yeah. they have principles it's of honest. textual criticism. <laughs> These are the exact same principles you would use with the manuscripts of any books if you had a ton of manuscripts. It's the exact same method that would be used of Quran manuscripts if Muslims did that sort of thing and didn't just burn everything. And Adnan's rep represented, he makes it sound like it's this huge problem, right? Again, nothing is, nothing is changing any fundamental Christian doctrine. The vast majority of variants are completely inconsequential. Um, either what you have, the two, the two main categories you have, they're either not viable, not viable, meaning there's no way this reading goes back to an original because it appears so yeah. late. They have not viable or they're just, they don't change the meaning of the text. Tons of variants. They don't even, you couldn't even translate them because that's how meaningless <laughs> are. Like, like again, spelling differences and so on. So he basically said, oh, how could guys in the 21st century do this? Guys in the 21st century have more manuscripts than ever before. And in Christianity, there's an entire science of examining these manuscripts and getting to the originals. M Muslims aren't doing that because they, they go around lying about their book being perfectly preserved. And, the, and, and historically, they burn all their manuscripts. And then they claim that they're... <laughs> my goodness. Yeah. Guys, you know we could do that, right? You know we could take one Bible manuscript, burn everything else, and they say, you see, there's only one Bible. The only problem is that would be massively deceptive. And we're not like that. Your guys were like that. <clears throat> your, your rightly guided caliph was like that. Um, anyway, all right. Any thoughts, Sam? 
Yeah, let me just add, number one, I want you guys to remember the difference between the transmission of the Quran and the Bible. Mm -hmm. We mentioned, this is according to their own sources. Their own sources testify, Uthman purged, burned Quran copies produced by the companions of Muhammad, and not everyone was in agreement. But let's put that aside. He purged and burned them, and he standardized what he felt the Quran <clears throat> actually should look like. Now, Muslims will say, well, that was a faithful replica of Muhammad past. Okay, let's put that aside. Okay. In Christianity, this is something admitted by scholars across the board, even those who are not Christians. When the books of the New Testament were written, they were being copied right away. And these copies were being sent to various locations so that <clears throat> the widespread distribution of the copies of the New Testament, keep this in mind, the widespread distri distribution of the copies of the New Testament made it impossible for one individual or a group of individuals to collect all these copies and then corrupt them in a in a fashion that suited what they believed and then produce copies from their corrupted editorial patchwork and destroy the evidence. That's what Uthman did, that's not what Christians did. So God made sure that from the beginning, the, the books of the Bible would be copied and would be distributed over the then known world so that no one person or group could monopolize the copies of the Bible, which is why, as we speak today, we have about 5,300 copies. Some would say 5,900, right, depending on how you count the manuscripts. Of the New Testament books in Greek, we have about nearly 10,000 copies of the books of the Bible, specifically New Testament, in Latin. And then we have various languages in which the books of the Bible were translated so that anywhere from 25,000 to 30,000 copies of the books of the Bible, specifically the New Testament, in existence in various languages found in different places showing the impossibility of wholesale corruption, guaranteeing that what was originally written is there preserved. And this leads me to the second point, second point, second point. Pick up a copy of John written in the second century and pick up a copy of, God, of John in the ninth century. And I guarantee you, you're going to get the same theology, the same father, the same Jesus, the same spirit, the same salvation. No copy of John in any century is going to give you Islam or Manichaeism or Gnosticism. It's going to give you the historic Orthodox Christian faith because the differences are inconsequential and you can know what the text is saying, even though there may be a variant reading, and just to <clears throat> piggyback from what David said, did you know that one of the major sources of variant readings is the definite article the? Many people don't know that in Greek, definite, not definite, proper names often have definite articles attached to them. For example, in Greek, you would have <clears throat> David's name preceded with the definite article, the David, the Sam, the John. And so some co copies you'll have a verse saying the Jesus and the Peter. Another copy says Jesus and Peter. Now, for the life of me, how does that change the meaning of the text? Just because one copy has the definite article before Jesus' name and another copy doesn't have the definite article because that doesn't even show up in English because in English we don't put definite articles before proper names. And that's, that's one of the major variant readings in the manuscript tradition. And then finally, David, maybe you can help me because you had a talk with Hatun. Isn't it true that the current Arabic Qurans are based on a 1924 edition of the Arabic Quran that was standardized by Al-Azhar in Cairo, Egypt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, so and, wait, they, and, they, and they still haven't been able to stop all the different variations. So wait, you're saying, guys, look at the irony. The Arabic Quran that you read today as part of your English translation is based off of what a scholar or a group of scholars in 1924 decided to standardize, and it doesn't agree in every single place with the extent manuscripts of the Arabic Quran. And this guy has the audacity to call into question the New Testament. Yep. All right, so guys, uh, notice, uh, if you wanted to know what the original reading of the Quran was, you'd have to take all available Quran manuscripts and do textual criticism, but that's exactly what Muslims make fun of. They make fun of that. That's why you can't do it, right? They think it's silly and ridiculous. And then you'd have to have 21st century guys deciding what the Quran said. Um, so anyway, the, the, and the second, the, the, the takeaway from what Sam just said there, guys, what Muslims think that Christians sat down 
and corrupted our scriptures and decided they wanted to insert all these doctrines. No Christian has ever been in a position to do that. You could sit down there and change your manuscript if you wanted. No Christian has ever been in a position to affect all copies of the gospel. In other words, you're sitting there. If you're sitting there, you're a Christian, you're in Alexandria. And you're trying to make a, I'm going to, I'm going to add some, my own doctrines right there. <laughs> that wouldn't change copies in the Middle East. That yeah. wouldn't change copies in Europe. It's not going to change all those copies. You cannot do it. You are in no position. They did not have a central authority that was even capable of doing something like that. In yeah. Islam, you did. And that's exactly what they did. Everyone hand over your copies of the Quran. We're going to burn them all. And then you're going to take this one that I have decided you need to take. And Muslims have, Muslims have no problem with that, mostly because they don't know it. Uh, but then they do have a problem with Christians who were never in a position to be able to do that. This is, a, this is an amazing know. religion. All right. Well, yeah. Oh, By well. the way, can I read this one comment? Because yeah, this yeah. was hilarious. By Doomslayer. He said, Adnan was so smart that he reversed his argument on himself. Genius. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. that. That summed it up perfectly. All right. Well, the the we are we are on the home stretch. I think we got one more one more clip and then uh, just his little conclusion. So just two just these last two clips. Oh. Oh In boy. other words, Bruce Metzger is saying here that set of probabilities are put against each other to determine as to what may be the original text of the New Testament. In other words, the Word of God. How can scholars in the 21st century, sitting around global libraries, decide? as to what may be the original writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and by extension the word of God as the Christians believe. Another very powerful book I strongly recommend before I go is the early text of the New Testament. In the very introduction of this book scholars state scholars like Charles E. Hill and Michael J. Kruger they insist that the quest for the so-called original text is almost over because now the scholars are even questioning the meaning of the word or the term original text. Um, notice once again, I mean, uh, I have to go ahead and point out, uh, e even if we take these things in the way Anand means them, he's done nothing but destroy his own God's affirmation of our book and his own prophet's affirmation of our book. But even there, when he's saying, how can 21st century scholars uh, compare probabilities? Guys, because there are different principles, right? It, you find the same thing in, in any historical endeavor, right? I mean, it's a principle of history that you try to go to early, early sources, right? It's another principle of history, history that uh, if, if you're worried about someone inventing something, you have the principle of embarrassment, right? That people, if they're going to invent something, they'll invent something that helps their case, not something that hurts their case. It's a principle of history that you look for independent sources, sources that are not simply copying each other, right? Guess what? There can be times when you have competing probabilities here. So take the issue of Muhammad. I'm saying this because I debated Robert Spencer on whether Muhammad existed, right? Oh. Robert Spencer will point out you don't have early sources on this guy, right? There's this big gap. He's supposedly going around fighting all these wars and no one mentions him. No one's even heard of Mecca, right? <laughs> so he's appealing to a historical principle that you should be basing your historical uh, investigations on early sources and you don't have any. Well, I base my argument on the principle of embarrassment. If Muslims were really inventing these things, they wouldn't have invented these stories because they're embarrassing. Therefore, I trust these stories, right? Notice, those are competing probabilities based on complete uh, competing rules. So if you take, um, if you're comparing two manuscripts, let's say you're looking at two manuscripts and you see, oh, here, here John is spelled with one N and here John is spelled with two Ns. I want to know which one goes back to the original. Well, there are competing rules that would, that you could say, oh, this one is found in more manuscripts, whereas this one is found in an earlier manuscript. Notice those are compete; those are competing rules that give competing probabilities, right? So you do you you do your best to assess that you would you would do that with anything. You do that with any book. You would do that if the Quran, if if Muslims were 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 more uh, more open to textual criticism and didn't just burn all their manuscripts. But that's what you would have to do today, Muslims, if you wanted the original text. You can't just go to the 1924 edition and say, this is it, and I'm pretending that, that there are no other manuscripts. You wouldn't do that if you were honest, right? So he's he's basically condemning anyone, <laughs> anyone who takes a bunch of information and then says, we're going to apply rules of textual criticism to try to get to the early reading. And Muslims sit back and laugh at this and make fun of it and say that it's a joke. And then their solution is, why don't you just burn everything, burn all the evidence, pick the one you like, and force that on everyone, and then lie. 
about the history yeah. of your book. That's how we do it in Islam. Why don't you Christians do it like that? It's almost <laughs> like you care about the truth and are trying to get to the original text. It's almost like you actually care and not like us who we just want to want to you know put a show on and pretend that we're we're completely united on all this stuff. Right. And you, you know what's what's ironic, uh, David, about that that statement. Even though Uthman purged the Qurans, mm -hmm. it still didn't stop the extent manuscript tradition of the Quran from containing thousands of variant readings, and it still didn't stop uh, Muslims having to standardize what they called the different qiraat, qiraat, right? Because a lot of people, Christians don't know that even when you speak of the Arabic Quran, you have at least. <clears throat> 14 different Arabic versions of the Quran called Qiraat or Qiraat, and then three to add to it for about 17, what they call the acceptable canonical readings of the Arabic Quran. And they go, oh, it's all inspired, and it all came from Allah. Now, David, could you imagine if I said to a Muslim, hey, the Gospel of John was revealed in seven different ways, but I don't exactly know what those ways are. And then it was passed on in seven different forms of the Greek. And of those seven forms, each form had at least two transmissions for a total of 14, and then three others that we added for good measure. What would Muslims say to me? They would find that uh, absolutely ridiculous. And if you did anything like if there were any time in history where Christians gathered all the Bibles together and burned them so they could issue, that's what they would point to to show the corruption of our text. They would say, look, you have variant readings. Oh, you had book burnings. This shows that your book's been corrupted. That's what they have in their tradition. We don't have we don't have anything like that. That's what they have. And they all ignore it. And they say one one Quran perfectly preserved down to the letter. <laughs> Wild stuff. All right. Surprise, well, David. Surprise. All right. Now, final clip. Finally. Oh, my goodness. This has been, You're this killing has me, been man. almost. You're killing me, man. I feel like I've, man, I've been in purgatory, bro. This I feel has been like almost, I'm in purgatory. My brain is fried, dude. My brain. I don't even know how I'm Ooh. still talking right now. All right. Last clip. I think this is a short one. So how do the Christian missionaries like David Wood and others respond? They respond by attacking the prophet. They respond by attacking the Quran. They respond by mocking the Muslims. This is not a way to respond. Defend the, the New Testament on its own terms and there are Christian scholars telling us that the New Testament was corrupted beyond repair. This is what the answer to your question is Mr. Wood. Whether you accept Islam or not is your choice. If you accept it is for your good. If you don't you will answer to God not me. I invite all the Christian brothers and sisters out there to listen to us carefully, take answers from us and contemplate on them instead of listening to those people who are in it for money, nothing more. Thank you very much. Adnan Rashid. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Wow. Uh, and, and notice he has to throw that little dig in there at the end. These, these people are interested in money, nothing more. Now notice. There is, ladies and gentlemen, you especially you Muslims who are watching, there is no possible way that your book came from God. There is no possible way that Muhammad was a true prophet. We know this. We know this for a lot of reasons. We know this for dozens and dozens of reasons. Sam and I once did a, a video series um, where we did a top 10 reasons Muhammad's not a prophet. And then we finished those. And we're like, oh, we got a lot more reasons. So we did another 10 yeah. reasons Muhammad's not a prophet. We ended up we ended up going doing five of those shows, giving 10 reasons each. We had 50 reasons Muhammad's not a prophet. But even if we threw out almost everything, if we we're just focusing on this issue, your God and your prophet affirm the inspiration and the preservation and the divine authority of the scriptures in our possession. And your Quran, your book, and your prophet and your God completely contradict our book on basic doctrines. Again, there are only two possibilities here. Either we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, or we don't. If we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because your book contradicts our book on basic fundamental 100%. teachings. If we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, 
Islam is false because your book affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of our book. So if we have the word of God, Islam is false. If we don't have the word of God, Islam is false. The only two possibilities here then are Islam is false and Islam is false. What does that mean? <laughs> it means yeah. that Islam is false. Oh, and yeah. what does that non respond? Oh, well, they just, you know, they're just attacking the prophet. Of course, we're attacking the prophet. He's a false prophet. He's, a, he's an obvious false prophet who committed these horrible, horrible blunders. And Muslims don't know about them because they don't read their own sources and they believe what leader what, what their leaders say and they believe what their apologists like Adnan Rashid say and they don't study this for themselves. And when their apologists are asked a simple question, instead of answering the question, they change the topic and pretend they've answered something when they've answered absolutely nothing. The problem yeah. remains, but the Muslims think it's been answered. And we're trying to break through that and tell you, guys, you have an obviously false prophet here. What are you doing following him? What are you yeah. doing following Hallelujah. him? Hallelujah. Right. <clears throat> Only thing I want to add, because again, you saw that he failed to address his challenge, actually confirm the challenge. The only reason why we even bring up Muhammad's view of the Bible is because we're dealing with Muslims. Muslims, you believe Muhammad is a prophet. You believe the Quran is a revelation given to him. That means you're stuck to what the Quran says about anything. So if the Quran talks about Jesus, uh, the scriptures, then that means you're stuck with it. David and I would never bring up Muhammad's view of the Bible if we're de debating a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon or an atheist or agnostic. But because Adnan is a Muslim, <clears throat> he cannot complain and whine when we then go to what he believes are authoritative sources from his God and messenger to show him, Adnan, your prophet said this about the Bible. Why do you take a contrary position? That's all we're doing. So if he wants to now appeal to sympathy and emotion to poison the well and to get Muslims irate and, and to cause them to react emotionally instead of understanding why we're doing this. Why are they picking on Muhammad? Well, we're not picking on him. We're showing you Muslims, you're stuck. Your prophet said, my Bible is the uncorrupt word of God. You're stuck. You got to believe it. My Bible doesn't tell me to follow the Quran. You're stuck with what the Bible says. And since the Bible exposes Muhammad as a false prophet, you've got to reject him. That's why we're appealing to Muhammad, because you believe him. If I'm talking to a Mormon, I'm not going to mention Muhammad. If I'm talking to an agnostic, like Matt Dillahanty when you debated him, the atheist. Did you bring up Muhammad, uh, David? Um, I don't know why. No, because I'm just wondering. If I'm going to prove the authority of the Bible to an atheist, I'm going to say, oh, and by the way, Muhammad said the Bible's uncorrupt. So now, my friend, you're stuck with it. Matt's going to look at you and me and say, man, you guys are a bunch of morons. Mm -hmm. Who cares what Muhammad said, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we quote Muhammad to show you Muslim. You believe Muhammad? You're stuck with my Bible. Now, why don't you do the only honest thing you can do? Give up on Muhammad, see him for what he is, an antichrist, a false prophet. Turn to the true Jesus who loves you and died for you who now lives to embrace you and give you everlasting life and to seed for you, turn to Jesus, the Son of God, your only hope of salvation. Stop being stubborn. Stop fighting. Turn to him. Amen. Um, someone asked for, let's see, someone asked for a source. I'm just actually trying to pull this up real quick. Um, let me find the actual question here. Uh, Sam, just go ahead and talk for, tell everyone something okay. for about 30 yeah, seconds. No, no, actually, just yeah, no, I thought, yeah, I'm fine. The, I can talk. I just, yeah. well, I was rushing. No, no, no I, I mean, uh, uh, on, on this particular topic, while I pulled up the source. Yes. Um, okay, guys, let tell me, them, let's repeat. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, tell, talk on this, on this issue as I'm pulling up the source. The question okay. was about the uh, burning of the Quran. Actually, I have it right oh, yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, volume so, six of the Quran. Yeah. Volume six, number five oh not the Quran. Bukhari, yeah. volume six, number five oh nine. Bukhari, volume six, number five oh nine, and then five ten. Volume six, number five ten. Five oh nine tells us that Abu Bakr commissioned Zayd to compile the Quran, and there were two missing verses missing until they found it with Khuzaima, uh, Khuzaima al Ansari. Then volume six, number five ten, in the old numbering. Volume six, number five ten. Yeah, I've, I've got the, I've got the new. Go, read it, go ahead. No, no, no I've, yeah, I've got the, I've got the new, the new numbering here, and I'll tell him where he can download this in case he, uh, in case he yes. wants it. Um, so this is number forty nine eighty seven. Oh, so anyway, the, the question was, uh, Jason Lippert said, um, "Is there a source I can cite 
for the burning of Quran manuscripts, keep up the good work. Uh, yes, there is indeed. And we will take a look at these if I have the technology here. Share screen and... All right, there we go. So, um, this is Sahih al-Bukhari. If you want this edition, go to kalamallah.com. It has the same uh, Darul Salaam edition that I'm using right now. So that is kalam, K-A-L-A-M, Ullah, U-L-L-A-H.com. And you can download this same edition of Sahih al-Bukhari. Uh, let's go ahead and read it. Narrated Anas bin Malik, Hudhaifa bin al-Yaman came to Uthman at the time when the people of Sham and the people of Iraq were waging war to conquer Armenia and Azerbaijan. Hudhaifa was afraid of their, the people of Sham and Iraq, differences in the recitation of the Quran. So why are these people, why are these people reciting the Quran differently? So he said to Uthman, O chief of the believers, save this nation before they differ about the book, the Quran, as Jews and the Christians did before them. So notice what he wants here. Uh, you've got to do something about these differences in the Quran. So Uthman sent a message to Hafsa saying, send us the manuscript of the Quran so that we may compile the Quranic materials in perfect copies and return the manuscript to you. Hafsa sent it to Uthman. Uthman then ordered Zayd ibn Thabit, Abdullah az Zubair, Said bin al As, and Abdul Rahman bin Harith bin Hisham to copy the original manuscript perfectly. But no, they, uh, they made some additions to it. Uthman, let's see. Oops, get over here. Uthman said to the three Qureshi men, in case you disagree with Zayd bin Thabit on any point in the Quran, then write it in the dialect of Quraysh as the Quran was revealed in their tongue. They did so, and when they had written many copies, Uthman returned the original manuscripts to Hafsa. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt and there is no reason to burn all these alternatives if they all said 100%. the exact same thing yep 100 percent, 100 percent. so you guys see the source now in the old versification it's number 510 volume 6 al bukhari and read the one before it volume 6 509 read the one before it. read both of them so we're not making it up their most authentic collection of narrations say uthman purge the qurans and guys, let me emphasize the significance of this. He was not purging Qurans done by Joe Schmoes, done by nobodies. He was purging Qurans that were written down by the companions of Muhammad who learned the Quran directly from Muhammad. Just to mention two, you had Abdullah ibn Masood and Ubay ibn Kab. These two men, Muhammad singled out four people to learn the Quran from, and two of the men were Abdullah ibn Masood and Ubay ibn Kab. What did Uthman do to their Qurans? Destroy them. By what authority did Uthman destroy copies of the Qurans written down from the memories of the two of the four that Muhammad himself said learned the Quran from them? In other words, if your prophet is telling you these are two of the four that you need to learn the Quran from, by golly, that means their Qurans are authoritative mm -hmm. and should have been mm -hmm. made... <clears throat> the standard for all other Qurans, but what did Uthman do? Now, nah, you know what? Burn them. Mm -hmm. We're going to take the one that's with Hafsa that was actually compiled by Zayd ibn Thabit. Zayd ibn Thabit only became a Muslim when Muhammad went to Medina, whereas Abdullah ibn Masood was a Muslim in Mecca and even said, Wallah, I learned over 70 surahs by heart before Zayd even became a Muslim. And I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, and what did Uthman say? Yeah. No, I'm going I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and quote Jamia Termidi number three uh, thirty one oh four, right? Uh, where Abdullah ibn Masud, whom Muhammad Muhammad said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from ibn Masud, and then the order goes out to for people to hand over their Qurans to have them burned, and then only to copy the copy of Zayd ibn Thabit. Abdullah ibn Masood says, Jami at Termini, 3104, O you Muslim people, avoid copying the Mus'haf and recitation of this man. By Allah, when I accepted Islam, he was but in the loins of a disbelieving man, meaning Zayd ibn Thabit, 
And it was regarding this that Abdullah ibn Masud said, O people of Iraq, keep the Musahif that are with you and conceal them. So the order goes out. The, the Musaf is a, is, a, is a copy of the Quran. So the order goes out, burn all of those, and you only get to copy this one. Ibn Masud attacks it, says, don't copy that man's Quran. Hide your Qurans that you have with you. Don't copy his. Now, guys, if they're all the same, <laughs> that would make no yep. sense. Not one word right. of that makes any sense. So Islam's own sources. Now, Sam, could you imagine if we had stuff like this? We had to deal with stuff like this that muslims would quote it you see this proves the corruption of their scriptures this proves that it is a deception this is all over their sources this is all over their sources david and what do they say shame on perfect you. preservation right down to the letter man david shame on you you are attacking muhammad and the quran just attacking when you should muhammad. have just you should have talked about bruce metzger and bart ehrman shame on you david how dare you attack quran and muhammad yeah. see you can't you can't refute my devastating refutation of your challenge now face the east and repent how dare you how dare you actually try and show to muslims that they're following a false prophet and that their leaders have been lying to them how dare you actually care about their well-being and their eternal destiny how dare you do that you, you 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 must just be in this for money, even though people like you are probably eventually going to be killed in the name of Allah. Yeah, yeah, boy. If you guys, if you want to make money, doing full time apologetics is not the field. I pro, trust me, you were not in it for the money. So if you're going to make money, go become an IT guy or a real estate agent. Apologetics, you're not going to. If you're doing it for the glory of Jesus, amen. Jump on board. All right. Well, pretty amazingly, Sam, there are still almost 1,500 people in the right? chat. We wow. understand that that Ooh, a lot of people must have super. left because we've been going forever, and we understand yeah. that you know. So a lot of a lot of you came along, but I understand there were probably quite a few of you who stayed for an entire four yeah. hours, and that is impressive. Um, yeah, ninety-five percent of them stayed because we were over six on sixteen hundred. We're still close to well, no, 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 no. Because some people leave and then new people join in because they see we're live. Get it? Oh, okay. All get right, it. I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm learning, bro. Uh, okay. All right, uh, hey, anyone, anyone who, uh, anyone who's been here the entire time, you get bragging rights. You get bragging rights right now, uh, and in the comments section afterwards. All right, well, guys, we went through Adnan's entire Torture. video. Torture. It was a simple, simple question. You, you Muslims believe the Bible's been corrupted. Anand clearly believes the Bible's been corrupted. Give us one verse, just one, just one verse, one, one. Anand couldn't do it. Uh, Mufasil couldn't do it. And the ones that Muslims quote in the chat and in the comment section, their apologists won't actually quote them to us. Why? Because their apologists know we know what these verses are saying. They know what they say in context. They know that we know the historical background. They know we will destroy that. And so they have to argue on uh, based on other means. And they have to go off on a bunch of other topics. Now, notice the only thing, the only things that Anand said that were actually relevant, he could have said in a two-minute video. Could have said those things in a two-minute video. He could have come out there yeah. and said, the only the, the only one of the only relevant things he he claimed was um that you know the deity of christ issue is a core doctrine whereas uh whereas uh, what the quran says about the books is is not a core doctrine and therefore we don't have to we don't have to have unequivocal verses on that because our, ours is not a, ours is not essential and the other thing would be um but you uh you know you you your books say that jesus died by crucifixion the quran denies this and therefore the quran is indirectly indirectly uh, assuming that your book has been corrupted and that he could have said that he could have said that in under 60 seconds and not had this 18 to 20 minute video but you have yeah. the 18 to 20 minutes to trick everyone into thinking that you offered this devastating refutation and that's why muslims are sending this, his video to me aha you've been refuted are you ready to accept islam well he didn't answer the one question he didn't answer the one simple question i asked and so epic 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 failure yep. ladies yep. and gentlemen yep. Yep. epic failure Glory to Jesus Christ. We made it through. Keep praying for us, David and I, and all of the rest of the apologists. Pray Jesus will keep us holy and pure in love with him and give us the health we need and watch over our families. Pray for my daughters and Lord Jesus willing. I'm sure we're going to do more because more videos are going to pop up. Now, with that said, do let Adnan know because we don't have to travel. We're now quarantined so we can do it via social media. Sam Shimon says two debates. Does the Quran teach Tawheed and does the Bible teach the Trinity or the deity of Christ? Two debates. 
on two separate occasions. Let's see if he'll he'll man up and use these arguments against me. So let him know. Sam Shimon said, hey, it's going to be a delightful debate, so don't make the excuse that I'm going to get... No, when I debate, uh, I try to keep it professional. You know that, David. Yeah, uh, so yeah, when he knows that. And uh, if he wants to do it on my channel, um, Sam, how, how neutral am I in debates on my channel? Super, super neutral to the point that it disgusts me. Yeah. Um, and uh, people wonder the secret. David, how can you not laugh at what this other person is saying? How can you be so neutral? It's easy. I deliberately ignore everything everyone is saying during the debate so that, uh-huh. and i focus just on keeping keeping time and stuff like that so uh all right i i see lots of i see lots of people who's, uh who are who are doing bragging rights for for being here the entire time my goodness you guys are warriors if you stuck in here Man, dude. for four Ooh. hours that's uh that's, that's torture awesome. for me and none killed me and none killed me i'm telling you he drained me bro i was gonna go do a walk right now i'm gonna go hit the bed and sleep i'm drained <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, anyone who wants to take any clips out of this and post them on your own channels as responses to particular arguments, um, those those should probably do well. You say Sam Shamoon's response to such and such on, you know, uh, on John fourteen twenty eight or something like that. People watch it, so you're free to do that. Uh, thanks to uh, everyone in super chat and super stickers, and we have multiple new channel members here. And I'll see you all tomorrow, where I will right. be live. With the Prophet Muhammad, who I, I've heard has coronavirus. And Dave, I've just let people know they've been wondering why I haven't been on for a week. You know, just, you know, some things came up. But God willing, you should see me live stream maybe tomorrow, if not by Monday. So look for me, Lord Jesus willing. So I'll go back to seeing about 100 people. He gets that just before his live stream. 100 show up already. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not <laughs> fair, nice. I tell you. Oh, yeah. And yeah. guys, uh, if you want the link to Sam Shamoon's. Uh, channel. Uh, it's in the description box, but you can also look up Sam Shamoon and, and find him there. But the link is in the description box if you want more from shameless Sam Shamoon. Shameless. They were telling me to do my pecs with the Hulk Hogan style. Yeah. Shameless Shamoon. There you go, folks. Brother, we'll see you soon, man. And keep us in prayer, especially my daughters, brother. <laughs> oh, sorry. There you go.